Rhodium Radio No Sad Podcast Rhodium Radio No Sad Podcast In the city City of Wilmington We keep it rocking So come on shake Shake it for me Kelly Yeah Dr. Dre is in full effect And I gotta tell y'all a little something Easy E is down with us MC Ring, you know he's down with us DJ Yella is down with us Arabian Prince, you know he's down with us Tony A. The Wizard is down with us JJ Fag is down with us Timmy T, you know he's down with us DJ Pooh Boy is down with us Toddy B and Spade, they're down with us My boy Ice Cube, you know he's down with us I like to mention, so pay attention to where I'm from Compton, but the tapes are from the rhodium My name is Dre, listen while I play And by the way, I'm also down with N.W.A. Yo, Steve at the rhodium is down with us Slangin' funky tapes, it is a must We're number one, 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 one. Tony A Welcome back, everybody, to Rodeo Radio, episode 48. And uh, before I int- introduce this West Coast legend, once again, you can get the Rodeo Mixtape Documixery at documixery.com right now using the promo code TRMD20, if I'm correct. And you can get a discount on 20%. So once again, at Rodeo, uh, the Rodeo Mixtape Documixery right now, you can use the coupon and get it for 20% off. You can view it. I think we're only going to have it up there for like two weeks. And right now, you can also buy the bundle pack of the, the mixtape downloads. So all eight of them are available. I'm working on right now, getting them on CD once again. So I'll have them, give me a couple of weeks. Also, we're uh, trying to plan out a date for the Rodeo Mixtape Documentary uh, DVD Blu-ray. Okay, so we'll, that's also coming. And eventually, after this corona crap uh, passes, we're going to have our shirts back up because we moved to a different uh, printer. So once again, without further ado, please allow me to introduce today this West Coast legend, Cold 187, Big Hutch, above the law, in the motherfucking building. <laughs> How you doing, brother? Man, I'm good, man. I'm blessed, man. How you doing, Tom? I- I'm blessed, brother. You know what? That's I right. wanted to ask you, uh, uh, how was the drive over here? Right, but no traffic. <laughs> and usually traffic coming out this way. Well, no traffic today. Uh, so, yeah. It almost looks I love like a it. ghost town. I love it. I, 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 mean, I love no traffic. I don't like it looking like a ghost town, but I like no traffic. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know yeah. what? Uh, let, let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. I know since this whole corona thing has been going on, a lot of us have had time to either catch up on stuff that we have on DBR or Netflix. Right. Have you seen anything good lately on TV, whether it be a movie, documentary? I've been looking at a lot of documentaries. Um really a lot of documentaries i watch a richard pryor documentary um um i watched the parliament you know what took me out the parliament funkadelic documentary i caught up on i never seen the p-funk documentary and then i watched um the documentary on malcolm x so a lot of docs man i you know okay i, yeah, I gotta yeah. i gotta see that a parliament uh, oh man you, you, it, it, it's 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 crazy man you know th- did that one just come out just came out yeah okay. it's on prime Okay, yeah, Amazon Prime. Yeah. I'm gonna have to watch yeah. that one. Yeah. And uh, you know, we got really got no sports right now. Yeah, you no, know, I, I just found out you're a Cowboys fan. Yeah, Cowboys Dodgers. Yeah, yeah dope. Cowboys <laughs> Dodgers. Yeah, no man. You know what? So um, mm-hmm. even though I may know a lot of your history, I always have to ask from a fan's perspective because if uh, if I only ask questions that I didn't know, the fans wouldn't really get the meat of it. I can you do know, it. if you will. Mm-hmm. So so let me ask you this: uh, uh, Where were you raised? At where, where did you grow up? At? I was raised. Well, I'm born. I'm, I'm born in Dallas. Um, I moved uh, to California when I was really really young, about eight nine years old, and I grew up in Pomona, California. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that'll work. You know, yeah. uh, so you went to school out here and everything? Yeah, I went to school out here. I went to elementary school in L.A. And then I moved, when I, when I went to uh, middle school, I moved to um, Pomona. I went in my sixth grade, you know, sixth, seventh grade, I moved to Pomona. And uh, from there, I grew up with the high school and everything out there. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and, and P-Town in the building. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what high school mm-hmm. did you go to? I went to Pomona, okay. but I grew up on the west side. Okay. You know, my dad, because all my friends, he didn't want me to go to school with all my friends, so I got shot over to um to school on the other side of town <laughs> growing up you play yeah. any sports yeah i played football i was oh, yeah. a football player yeah. what, what position um defensive back and running back for real yeah mm-hmm. i was gonna say yeah. defensive end maybe yeah or yeah I, 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 I could have played linebacker but I, I was i was more of a um i played free safety and um safety and um uh, left db and then running back when um 
when I was young. That's so, dope. Yeah. You have mm -hmm. a, a college professional football team that you like to follow? Uh, not SC. I mean, I like SC, SC a lot. Yeah, because I, I, yeah. I remember back in the day, yeah. University of South Central. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah that's dope, man. That's dope. <laughs> you remember that? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what? Now, even though I may know your family history, I have mm -hmm. to ask. Okay. Uh, growing up in a musical, if you will, family, mm -hmm. what type of music was played in your household growing up? Well, for me, like like everything from since I grew up, um, once I grew. One, I grew up studying in jazz. I played jazz in high school. Oh. I played trumpet. Um, I played bass guitar and I played piano. Um, so a lot of jazz, um, um, a lot of rock and roll, and definitely a lot of R and B, soul, funk, you know, blues. Yeah, because right. you know my my dad's um, Richard Hutch, which is a writer and composer from Motown, and my uncle's Willie Hutch. Yes. So we did the Mac, Foxy Brown, and. Um, a lot of ex, you know, uh, and they worked. They wrote for the Commodores, um, the Fifth Dimension, um, the Jackson Five. You yes. know, they wrote "I'll Be There" and "How Funky Is, is Your Chicken." Um, so yeah, I grew up on that man. A lot of Motown. So totally. primarily a lot of Motown for real. From Temptations, uh, Philadelphia Sound of Music. You know, mm -hmm. Isaac Hayes, of course. Uh, uncle Isaac, rest in peace as well. Yes. As pops and, and my uncle. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, that. Is, it, it, but I know everything from the Beatles to Tupac, so, you yes. know, that, that's how I rock. So, so okay, you know, you mentioned <laughs> blues and mm -hmm. you mentioned rock. Okay. Yeah. I saw a documentary and I, I would like to re, uh, uh, recommend it to people. It's not much. There's about an hour long. Mm -hmm. I wish they had a little bit more information on this one individual named uh, Robert Johnson yeah. from Mississippi. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, Robert Johnson. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people credit him for possibly, and I may be wrong, but for the the beginning or the template of blues, yeah, and eventually rock, rock and, and roll. roll, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now uh, you heard of his story, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Supposedly he went to the crossroads, yeah. made a deal with the devil, right? Exactly. Now, now just yeah. just to ask, <laughs> how how true do you think that is? I, you know, a lot a lot of times when it comes to success, I think it, it sometimes it's, it's a lot of hard work and involved. But then I think that. I think that that doesn't dictate the success that you have. I think if you made a deal with the devil, you made it because of a personal reason. I don't really think that <laughs> dictates your success because I know a lot of people that are highly successful that don't have anything to do with that. But it's a great story. Yeah, it's a great story. You know what I mean? yeah, it's a great story. And so, I recommend people to go on Netflix right. and watch it. Yeah. Uh, another thing re re uh, really quick that I want to uh, touch on. He was the first guy uh, as far as a music a musician that mm -hmm. died at 27. Oh yeah, a lot, yeah, yeah. Janis Joplin, Joplin, Jim Morrison, mm -hmm. Jimi yeah. Hendrix, and the, the list, list goes, goes on. on. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. And yeah, that at number 27. Uh, yeah, you, you know yeah. what, so let, now let me ask you this. Uh, as a kid, I, I know you said mm -hmm. you played musical instruments and you were uh, raised in a musical family. Yeah. Uh, what was your first job if, if you had one? My first job, um, I worked for, um, it, I don't know if you guys remember this, it used to be a, a company called bonds for men they, they they're like they became um the warehouse for men like the suit place oh okay yeah and i worked there in high school i, I sold suits my man big al uh, gave me a job <laughs> and um i sold suits when i was like <laughs> 50 60 60 years old then i started working for foot like i always was in the retail for some reason oh, selling something yeah i guess that's yeah. why i started hustling you know? <laughs> Exactly. So yeah, you know yeah. what's cool because mm -hmm. when you look at your profile on Instagram, you have a lot of pictures with nice suits. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. dope. That's man. that. And you know, my dad, my dad, I come from dressing sharp. Yes. You know, I've always been a fashionable person. Even if you look at a lot, a lot of the old above the law pictures, like we like to dress. We like to dress down, but we like to get fly too. You know, that was yes. our whole image. You know, right. So okay. Yeah. Now I, I know, I know, in, in one sitting, we're not going to be able to get to everything, but I'm going to ask you some really, really good questions. Uh, at what point in time did you yourself start dabbling in music, like creating your own music, whether it be sampling or just playing or recording yourself or and obviously before Ruthless. Yeah, I, I started making, actually wanting to make records when I was like in the, when I was in a sophomore in high school. Um, I was really inspired to make records. I actually just wanted to be a musician, like a session musician, and I wanted to make records, but I kind of wanted to be more behind the scenes at the, at the point that I wanted to be more of a writer, composer, producer. Yes. Um, I didn't want to become an artist until hip hop came along. Then I felt like, okay, I can take my music to this whole new level because it, it after, you know, I was studying music since I was six years old. So for me, just like, okay, making music, making music. As you get older, it's like, 
you know, like you have kids, you tell them like you know, I always I always try to tell parents like don't don't do your kid like that. Let them find themselves because when I was young. My father let me find myself. If I wanted to do sports, he let me do sports. I want to do music. I want to do music. But when I when I started getting into hip hop, that inspired me to actually want to do it as a profession. You know, like as the artist. You know, I always wanted to, to produce and write, compose, and do it just like follow my father's footsteps. But the artist part, hip hop inspired me to do that. So I, I started getting into. I bought me a little drum, okay. little little Sonic beatbox thing, and started doing that. Then I started being in hip hop crews and at that time it was break dancing and stuff yes. like that going on. It wasn't really heavy on the West Coast. This was, everything was more East Coast. Yes. So you're more inspired by the East Coast stuff. As I got a little older and then I, I graduated from high school um and started being in the streets, that's when I actually started feeling like, okay, and then I met DJ Chaos. Well, we went to we went to high school together, and we always wanted to do some stuff. Well, we was all over the place, and then as we became young adults, and we was in the streets, we ran back into each other. We was hustling. Yeah. And he was like, "Yeah, man, let's you know, I want to I want to do the music thing again because we was we was developing music in high school. We actually did a deal with a European company. On we did this we we did like this little skit thing, and then um some executive heard about it, and they signed us. They signed a deal when we were like seniors in high school. We used to be a crew called the Wizards of Rock. That's when everybody had breakdancing crew. Yeah. So that was a breakdancing crew that we rapped to. Okay. You know what I mean? So we did that little licensing deal because that's when those UK companies were coming out here and yes. signing a lot of hip hop. Nobody was signing hip hop here. <laughs> so as you know, so after we got out of high school, we was like, uh, well, I gotta work, I gotta do this, I gotta grind, I gotta do it. So we started hustling really heavy in the streets, and then we was like, man, let's put, let's start working on music again. So we took our hustle money, and then we developed above the law. Me, him. Um, me, DJ Chaos, KMG, um, and then um, then we met Laylaw through uh, one of our other mutual friends. My man Dooley used to hustle with us, um, and his brother E. Um, they knew um, this cat named Gomek, which was Laylaw's brother, and we all used to hustle together. We was like young hustlers in the streets together. We was like, yeah, my boys, they they working on some music out in Pomona, and it was like, oh yeah, my boy E got a label. Let me see what they working with. So we started developing above the law. So finally we developed it. We developed it. We shot the demo to um to um Layla. And then he shot it to Easy. And at that time they was trying to fill roster spots right. for Ruthless Records. It hadn't really popped yet. They had just dropped Supersonic was out. Um 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 Straight Outta Compton was being done. And then they were finishing that and then they was putting out the Easy Easy album. So when all that blew up, that was like, y'all wanna do a deal with us? And was like, yeah, sure. So we waited, they went on tour and um, we didn't hear nothing. It, shit went cold, yeah. you know what I mean? As it does, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, so we still hustling. We mad hustling like crazy in the streets, man. You know, so crazy that we started making a lot of money. <laughs> They're like, what the record deal, you know, at that point. So here's the funny thing. Easy call called me off tour and he was like, Hey man, you know, I'm hearing some things. I'm hearing y'all out there wilding, man. I'm trying to sign y'all. You know, I can't sign nobody that's, you know, gonna be locked up. Yeah. So y'all need to cut that shit out. Straight like that. That's what Easy said. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, we'll sign us then. So uh when the tour wrapped up, he signed us and the rest is history, living like hustlers. Now, you know? uh, uh, mm -hmm. now let me ask you several questions. Mm -hmm. uh, was Above the Law the name of the group? Had it always had it always been that, or did you guys have a name prior to that? Well, we was a clique at first. We was a clique called HBC, called Hustlers Beyond Control, because we was just a clique of hustlers. Okay, moving weight. Um, when we actually decide to form as an actual group, mm -hmm. we actually became Above the Law. Okay. You know what I mean? Like okay. when we actually start being serious about it. Like when we was, you know, like, because, you know, that scene, like how you were saying, like how when you used to be at the Rhodium and, and cast with DJ, we was just really was some hustling dudes that was DJ and rapping. So that was our click name. Yeah. We hadn't, we hadn't developed it to a point. When we start making the records, like when we start doing Living Like Hustlers, um, when we start doing Murder Rap, when we start doing those demos, that's when we became above the law. We figured like, okay, now it's something. You know, it's just not us doing like house parties and rocking out, throwing big ass parties, D boy parties, because we threw a lot of D boy parties. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where we just, it was just us and bitches, like, oh, we turning up or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's wild. We wilding, you know? So when we realized that we have an actual concept, that's when we named it Above the Law. Okay. And, and what inspired your rap name? Did you, and did you have one before <laughs> that? I, I did. I had B boy Hutch. Okay. 
you know, and and at the time I was like, since we call above the law, we all wanted ill names. You know what I mean? Right. So so I was a battler. As okay. Bebo Hutch, I always was a battler. I was the you know I was the seek and destroy, kill, whatever. You know, so. <laughs> My man DJ Chaos was like, which is like my brother to me. He was like, he was like, man, you know, wherever we go, you be killing motherfuckers. You be killing them off, man, like a murderer. I said, yeah. I said, you know, it'd be dope. What about 187? Yeah, yeah, you a cold murderer. I said, yeah, cold 187. You know what I mean? And that's how we came up with it. Dope. You know, because just because my battle, I didn't never have a battle name, but I used to always battle. Like when we go to when we go to places, they would mix against fools, and I would battle against fools. Right. You know what I mean? So that was a the theme. So when we start, so when we actually in in, in um so. After we had that, then I put the UM on the end, which just makes you say seven, co-187, right. yeah. you know what I mean? So, so yeah, that's how we came up with it. You know, you know now yeah. before Bub the Law forms, mm -hmm. obviously you guys were a clique. Yeah. What rappers were you bumping back then? I was bumping everybody. I mean, I mean, you know, I was bumping everybody. EPMD, um, Run DMC, PE. Um, it wasn't a lot of West Coast at the time, right. you know what I'm saying? Um, stuff like King T, Spade and them, Toddy, you know, um, who was popping back then? Um, like like crazy, like LL. super popping. LL was popping, yeah. yeah. All the East Coast stuff, yeah. Uh, yeah. Kane, LL, Rakim, Eric and Rakim, the Payton Full album was crazy. Okay. Um, it's a bump that. Run was Run DMC was my biggest influence as far as becoming an MC. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like oh. that that was the best, that, cause that's my high school years. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like that's that's like my early embryo. That's like the middle school, high school, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. As I got a little older, stuff got a little little like LL dropped. Uh, P.E. drop, all these different people dropped, and then the game got kind of raw. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. You know, the early hip-hop stuff is kind of right, you know, it's kind of eh, like BDP, all that stuff. So as as I get, as we start moving into the late 80s, then that's when the more hardcore stuff came out. The Schooly D, the Just Ices, the, you know, then uh, Ice-T, yes. big Ice-T fan, uh, crazy yeah. Ice-T. You know, well, you know that above the law is a big Ice-T fan because, you know, a lot of stuff is based upon hustling and grinding. Yeah. You know, it's the template. It's, you know, he was the soundtrack of our life, basically. Dope, you know, dope. So. You know uh, my other question is this. For producers that may be listening, mm -hmm. when you guys started making those above the law, you know, living like hustlers album yeah. demos, Mm -hmm. What type of equipment were you guys using at that time? Oh, back then? Oh, my God. What were we using back then? Uh, SP-12. Uh, the SP-12 uh, drum machine. Yeah, the drum machine. SP-12. Um, what was it? Juno 106. The keyboard. Um, what else was out back then? Um, uh, you got um, a four-track, uh, eight-track? Oh, yeah. Definitely four-track to eight-track. There wasn't a lot of stuff out right. at that time. Well, you know, it, um, yeah, it was analog. Everything was analog. So, um let me see the Oberheim drum machine, um, the Lindrum. Remember the Lindrum? Um, not it was no samplers out really at that time, but the SB12. So that's the only thing the samplers. Right. right. Um, and what people need to realize that SB12 only had ten seconds of sampling. Only had ten time. seconds. Yeah. You had to be wise with yeah. your time. That's why you flipping every. That's why we flipping everything. Like when you hear murder rappers, like you know, you got the backwards drum, you got the siren, you got it's all chopped in pieces. Uh -huh. You know, because that's how we had to do it, to chop, you know what I'm saying? Then, you know, so it's, it's all this is funky drummer going backwards right. and forward. Right, right. And it's the iron side siren and it's and it's um um the 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 drum the the, the drum fall from um philosophy You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's that's that cool. so we dropping all these different things. You know, to create one beat, you know. Yeah, that's the thing that you had to do on SB12. That's dope. You know, that's so, so like, yeah. For me, having an SB12, that was my first drum machine. Steve Yano had an 808, of course. Yes. Know, 808, uh, Steve Yano had bought me that drum machine. So, uh, to, for me to make a bottom beat, I was always mm -hmm. sampling the um, Ultimate Breaks and Beats. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, cause that was a big part, if you that's will, it, yeah. of, of Ruthless. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 of yeah. Beats. Yeah. Now, you, know, you met me going through the crates. So. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And yeah. and now, you mm -hmm. guys finish up that demo. Mm -hmm. How many songs would you say were on that six. demo? Six. It was six songs. Was okay, six songs. Yeah, the six songs were um, um, Murder Rap, Untouchables, um, Minister Society, Living Like Hustlers, and one more was the other. Oh, Balling and Flow On. Yeah, okay. those songs were done. Dope. All those songs were done. We just, what me and Dre ended up doing, me and Dre, since it was eight, it was done on an eight track. We just bumped it up. It was all done on an eight track and a 16 track. We just bumped up to 24 at Audio Achievement. We recut everything. Dope. We went through my crate and took everything and recut everything. 
you, you know, know on that so. on that song living like hustlers you know it goes mm -hmm. living like a hustler yeah. and it goes Chick -a -brr. what yeah. was that that's from the um the hickabur the record's called hickabur it's this it's, it's a i used to <laughs> funny thing about it i i that's the song that quincy jones produced for the bill cosby show oh wow yeah and i used to have this record that i used to use a lot a lot back then it were tv tunes Okay. That's what I got Ironside from. Um, Sanford and Son beat his on there. Um, the Bill Cosby show, which is doom, doom, doom. That's the Bill thing with yeah. Bill Cosby. Hoo Hickey Burr. Yeah, it's called Hickey Burr. See, yeah. th those little so, noises is what always yeah. stood out to so me. So that's on the sample. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, now, no. Hickey Burr. That's so how you, it goes. So yeah. you guys get signed to Easy. And now let me ask you this. Uh, I guess this is. If I'm correct, you guys' first deal? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's absolutely our first uh, deal. <laughs> the, the, the money situation, were you happy with it? Yeah, I was, yeah. Okay. Because it's the first legal money I made in, in years. <laughs> like, for real. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, hey, I, I could make my father proud. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that was cool with that. You know what I mean? And, and plus, it was opportunity to become a superstar, you know, at the time because Rufus was a powerhouse. Yes. So I, I definitely was happy with it. Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, a, a freshman deal, you know, a rookie deal or whatever people want to say. Um, and it's 1988-89, so yeah, it's a beautiful thing, yeah, you know, well, and it's legal. So yes. what are we going to do? You know? Yes. So I wasn't happy with a lot of people in my in my business at the time, but I was very young, and, you know, we're all very young. So, yeah. you know, that's the story goes. Let me share uh, with the public when I first met you. Okay. I walk in with Steve, and I remember you were wearing a gray sweater. Okay. Now I walk <laughs> into the main studio room. Dre's up here mm -hmm. on the board, and uh, uh, you were right here by the turntable. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you were playing sequence. I'm gonna funk you, you right on mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. And I remember you told Dre with these words, "This is black bumping. We need to use this." Mm -hmm. And then he was like, "Ah, oh, you know, I like it, but I don't like those bubbly sounds that yeah, have in there." Exactly. So I don't know if you guys ever ended up using it later on, but I, I re might have. <laughs> but, but, but I remember, uh, and I was wondering, like, like who this? Who, who is this guy? But that was the first time. Right, right, right. And Steve Yana goes, "Oh, that's above the law." And I was like, yeah, "Oh, okay, right. cool." Yeah. So the second time I went back, Dre goes, tells me, you're a DJ, right? And I was like, yeah. He goes, I want you to listen to this. Not, not, now I got murder rap. Yeah. That shit right there blew my socks off, bro. You know, yeah. and, and then again, mm -hmm. as a DJ and as a mm -hmm. beginning producer, yeah. when I start hearing that shit go backwards. Yeah. F -f 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 Foo, foo, foo. Yeah, yeah. It's just like what? What, what inspired? I, I'm I'm just asking a goofy question. Well, you put know. it like this: I, I, when I was doing murder rap, I was you know because it had funky drummer going straight. Yes. And I said, okay, why don't I make it go backwards? You know what I'm saying? Okay. Because everybody was doing it straight. Everybody was using that as a template to like you know yes. for as MCs and you know because you know that the rhythms how you can you could chop. On yes. funky drummer, so I was like, okay, that's dope to put the drums in that, but let's spin it backwards. So I always was me being a musician made me want to experiment more with the technical part of making hip hop, you know, because I always I didn't ever think in the box, like I never like say let's flip let's flip shit, you right. know what I mean? And and that's the way I felt about when I did murder rap. I wanted to be very very different. I wanted to be very very unique cuz people always say like w it was like a mix between PE and then WA and then you get yes. bur you get above the law murder rap. That's yeah. what it was like. So I didn't want to do it straight like the bomb squad were doing their stuff, but although I didn't want to make it like a gumbo sound like they did, but I wanted to have our twist on it, you know, for yes. the West Coast twist too. Okay. You know? See, yeah. and I'm getting a lot of my answers that I wanted to ask back then yeah, that's right yeah. you know and then mm -hmm. i remember donovan walks in yeah uh mike sims because i recorded yeah. ha half of a uh, um a high seas album over there but, yeah, uh, yeah donovan back then had the shit though back yeah, donovan then. was incredible man i mean you know without donovan smith the dirt biker smith i don't think we would have the sound we had yes i mean he was he was so sonically he was so he knew he, he knew what we wanted yes. you know for some reason he knew what we wanted I mean, and that's the magic of it. You got to have a great engineer that understands what we're all doing right. in there. And that's one thing that Donovan knew. Donovan knew, like, you know, it has to be this certain way, but I'm not going to never lose the integrity of what you guys are trying to do. He wasn't. A lot of other studios we would go back into then would try to tell us what to do instead of trying to figure out how can we make it work. The great thing about him, he always figured out how to make it work. Yes. All those samples, all that, okay, tone this out. You want to take take these frequencies out. He knew all that shit. Right. We, didn't, we were young kids. We didn't know all that shit like that to that, that level. 
You know, not even Dre. I mean, you know, we were young. We all we all learned a lot from him as an engineer. I, I like the, and you know, I know how to engineer really well. You know, from the engineers, two people that taught me how to engineer is Donovan Dirtbike Smith and uh, Mark Palladino. They taught me everything I know how to make records. You know, um, along with Dr. Dre. You know, sonically, they don't. They're the three guys that taught me how to really make records. Like, know sonically what to do when I go in the room. So, you know, so that's the thing that's important about Donovan the Dirtbiker is that there's no straight out of Compton. There's no easy does it. There's no no one could do it better. You got the J.J. Fab record. You don't got Above the Law or the Michelle A. record. The first um, records that came out of Ruthless Records, we don't have those records sonically sound like you guys really love them without those engineers, without without that engineer. That guy's incredible. Absolutely. You know, you know I know this is, uh, we'll touch on this a little bit later. That's mm -hmm. why I was somewhat disappointed that they didn't have somebody playing a little a Donovan in straight out of Compton. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, he was he's an important he's an important guy in it. You know. Do, do you remember on the couch right with the here's the turntables, yeah. the mixer, and then there was a couch right here. And then yeah. he had the the SB12 keyboard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't mm -hmm. know what that was called, but I call it the SB12 oh, keyboard. Oh, that's the um um you're talking about the um is S1000 was it? I I, it was I, S1000. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's the that can sample that was a sampler that that's S1000. It could sample like minutes of stuff. Exactly. And and we only used it for like like clips of stuff like if we wanted to do a long clip of something or if we had to do a long phrase or something because it was very hard to work at the time like <laughs> like a spaceship landed yeah in the exactly or some shit, you know <laughs> exactly because mm -hmm. by the time me and high c went in there mm -hmm. i had a four bar loop and, yeah and there was no way in damn hell i was going to be able to sample you know a bar 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 on an sp12 that would yeah. take up all my time mm -hmm. so donovan asked me what are you going to do so i thought i'll just write it yeah, yeah and then yeah, he was like, like through the whole song and i was like I don't know how else to do it. And he said, play the record. And then that's when he jumped on it. On the S, yeah, he could he could work it. And he sampled four bars. The whole pass. And yeah. just looped it. Mm -hmm, yeah. That mm -hmm. shit was hard, man. Yeah. So now, here's my other experience. The third time I went to Audio Achievements was about three days later. Mm -hmm. And Dre, um, uh, he was listening to uh, Untouchable. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. On the small speaker. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And it's 10. Yes. And um, he goes, come here. I want you to listen to something. And uh, I came and sat down. And he goes, we're gonna play it back. So he rewinds the two inch, yeah. And he starts starts it off. That motherfucker gave me the fucking chills when yeah, he boom, put it on the big speakers. Boom, 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 boom. Yes, dude. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, now I, I have to say this. My favorite song, though, even though uh, I have to say that uh, my second favorite is Untouchable, mm -hmm. but I'm okay. kicking lyrics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and I wanted to ask yeah. you, what is your Favorite song off of that in, on King and Lyrics, yeah. King and Lyrics. Lyrics. Now, why? And that's the record, you know, funny about it, that's the record that me and Dre done together. Really? That's the record that me and him actually done together on that record. We did that. We did Freedom of Speech together. We did three records together. We did Freedom of Speech. And the last song we did, we did, um, we did uh, From the Ground Up, we did Kick and Lyrics. We did um, Freedom of Speech. And we did the last song together. Okay. Like from the ground up. Like okay. Nothing was conceived. We did that okay. from the ground up. Me and him. That's what let you know how me and him together is ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that's, you know, it's crazy, man. You oh. know, that that's, that's one of my favorite. That That is my favorite record off that record. You know, now, now, I think because I think I think because of what's behind it, the story behind it, that goes behind it. Like, you know, it, it's, it's like working with somebody that I looked up to. Yes. Growing up and then doing a record with him actually from the ground up. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, because when I, I remember one time I was at a house party and I played it mm -hmm. and uh, people were just drinking, people were just yeah. jamming. So mm -hmm. I said, fuck it, let me play it again. I picked up the needle, dropped that motherfucker again. Mm -hmm. Somebody goes, you going to play a song again? That's my favorite song right now. Dude. Yeah, that's dope. You know, <laughs> that's, my, that's my shit right there. Yeah. Now, another thing that back then I, I noticed that, uh, uh, on the DLC album, mm -hmm. on the, uh, I want to say, shoot, I may be wrong. If my mind serves me correctly. Well, I know on your album yes, and yes, on the NWA, I think there was a, everybody had a posse. Parental, yes. parental discretion. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Th that's what I think, if you ask me, is missing today. Me too. You know, yeah. so. Yeah. But here's what we're going to do. Uh, uh, I got a lot of, a lot of dope 
questions I need to ask you and a lot of questions from the fans. Well, I'll be here. We're going to take a 10-minute break. We're going to come right back, and we're going to jump right back into it. I'll be here. So, dope, dope. So, everybody, once again, call somebody, text somebody, pimp slap the shit out of somebody, let them know <laughs> that Cold 187, Big Hutch, above the laws in the motherfucking building, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. What it do, what it do, it's Mr. Little One chilling on Rhodium Radio with the one and only Tony A and John motherfucking Elkin, boy. Hey, what up? It's your boy, Mr. Shadow. You're watching Rhodium Radio with my homeboy, Tony A, the wizard. You know what time it is. Yeah, what up? This is Mr. Night Owl, and you're listening to Rhodium Radio with the legendary Tony A, the motherfucking wizard. Yo, what's cracking? Nosotros somos Aqua. Estamos aquí con Tony A, the wizard. You know what it is. Radio, damn it. You know what it is. Yo, what up? This is Mellow Man Ace and Padrino. And you tuned in to Rhodium Radio with my man Tony A. Keep it locked. Yo, what's cracking? It's your boy OG Arabian Prince from the world's most dangerous group, NWA. Sitting here with my boy Tony A, the wizard, on Rhodium Radio. What's up? This is Esther Dazzle, Spanish Fly, Harbor Area's finest. Tune in to Tony A on Rhodium Radio. What's up, everybody? It's your homegirl, Magic Girl, and you are now listening to Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the wizard. Yo, what's up? This is Bozo, a.k.a. Emiliano. You tune in to Rhodium Radio on Tony Vision's YouTube channel. Let's get it. What up, what up? It's Mr. Soto. You guys are now in tune to Rhodium Radio right here on Tony Vision on YouTube. Yo. Check it out. This is MC Poncho on the MIC. Shout out to Tony A, the wizard, Rhodium Radio. You already know. What up, this is DJ Trick, Spanish Fly, and you're watching Tony A on the Rhodium Radio Show. Big G, Rhodium Radio, Tony A in full effect. Stay tuned, watch, listen. This is how we doing it over here. Yo, what up? I'm out here. This is Big Daddy Swoles. I'm jamming with my man, Tony A, the wizard, out here on Rhodium Radio. The podcast is off the hook. Check us out. This is DJ Clientele, and you are listening to Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the wizard. Yeah, 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 this Baby Bounce here with Tony A, the wizard. You are now tuned in to the Rhodium Radio. We do it for the people. You hear me? Mic check, mic check. Ernie G from Proper Dos. And I'm listening to Tony A, the motherfucking wizard on Rhodium Radio. And if you don't know, you should know. What's up, everybody? This is Soren Baker. I'm the author of the book, The History of Gangster Rap, in stores now worldwide. And you're listening to Rhodium Radio, hosted by Tony A. Make sure to check it out. We talk about the Rhodium mixtapes. We're here. Soren Baker, Rhodium Radio. Y'all, this is Reedy Greg, and I'm chilling with Tony the Wizard on Rhodium Radio. Yo, this is Daniel Jones, the D to the motherfucking G Media Clips. Here with your boy, Tony A the Wizard on the Rhodium Radio Show. Hey, this is Swifty Blue. I'm right here at Rhodium Radio with Tony A the Wizard. Stay tuned. It's the KAS here live on Rhodium Radio with the one and only Tony Gay, the wizard. What up, y'all? This is Kiki Smooth, the first Mexican rapper out of Compton, rich and ruthless, and you're listening to the Rhodium Radio with Tony A, the Grand Wizard, El Mago himself. Hey, Compton's in the house. What's up? It's quite the Yes Guy with my Harbor Otter got homeboy Tony A, the wizard on Rhodium Radio. Yes, guy. Hey, what's up, Hente? It's your homeboy Duende. You're tuned into Rhodium Radio with my homeboy Tony A the Wizard. Ya te la sabes, wey. What up, what up? It's your boy Baldacci the Beast, F from Music, Face of LA. Right here at Rhodium Radio. Make sure y'all tune in. Your boy Tony A the Wizard. Brah. What's up? This is DJ Dominator, and you're listening to Tony A on Rhodium Radio. This is Kelvin Anderson, owner of the world famous VIP Records, and you listen to my man Tony A the Wizard. On Rhodium Radio. Yeah, yeah, what up? It's Lil Black, you the Brown Super Bowl, and you checking out Rhodium Radio with the homeboy Tony A, the Wizard. Yo, what's cracking? It's your boy OG Big Wicked, Real Ones Apparel, Orange County. I hear my boy Tony A, the Wizard. Rhodium Radio. Yo, make sure to peep it. Peace. Que tranza raza, aquí su servidor, sinful and pecador. And you listening to Rhodium Radio with my boy. Tony A, the wizard. Check, check, what's up? It's your boy Capital I, man, from the Mexican crew. And you're tuning in to Rhodium Radio with my boy Tony A, the wizard. This motherfucker's a legend.
What's up, y'all? This is Chris the Glove, and you're watching the Rhodium Radio Show on Tony Vision on YouTube. What's up? This is Mr. D on Rhodium Radio, kicking back with the homeboy, Tony A. Yo, this is Fancy the Boss. Tune in on YouTube at Rhodium Radio with Tony A. the Wizard. What's up? This is Leah Farsayer, a.k.a. the Dragon, the Serpent, the Spear. I'm on Rhodium Radio with my boy, Tony the Wizard. Hey man, Nick V and Eric V, the Baker Boys in the house, hanging out with Rhodium Radio, and the one and only Tony the Wizard. Tony the Wizard, aka Kylo Ren, Ooh. right here on YouTube, Sundays and Wednesdays. Tony Vision, subscribe Tony now. Tony Vision, yeah, Baker yeah, yeah. Boys, baby. What's good with it? This is Old Creep, aka Jay Stompanato. I'm putting it down for Orange County on the Rhodium Radio Show by West Coast legend DJ Tony A. We up and out this bitch. What's up with it, dog? It's West Coast Gilly on Rhodey on Radio with the legend, Tony A. The Wizard on Tony Vision. You know what it is, West Coast to the fullest. Believe that. What's up, everybody? This is Stefan Orrier listening to Rhodium Radio with Tony A. The Wizard. Yo, what up? It's Big M.O.C., Mr. Mox MC on the Rhodium Radio Show with Tony A. The Grand Wizard, baby. Let's go. Yo, what up? It's your boy Doughboy Tony. You're tuned into Rhodium Radio with West Coast legend Tony A. The Wizard. What up, it's your boy Lottie the G, straight out of Santa Ana, CA, and we're right here live in the mix with the West Coast legend, Tony A. the Wizard, on Rhodium Radio, Tony Vision, on YouTube. Yo, what's up? This is John motherfucking Elkins, and you're tuning into Rhodium Radio with my homeboy, DJ Tony A. the Wizard. What up, West Coast and all hip-hop fans? This is your girl, Violet Brown, and I'm here with Tony A. the Wizard. And if you're rolling with us right now, that means that you love West Coast hip hop. And if you want to know the real deal from the real players, the real people behind the scenes, you better pick up Tony's new film, Rhodium Mixtape Documixery. You get it by going to documixery.com. You better get this. And I want to do a special shout out and a rest in peace to my man, Steve Yano. I'm out. Lonzo, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You sure? Motherfucker, I'm ready, goddamn!
Cut. We're good. Welcome back, everybody, to Rodian Radio, episode 48. I almost said 38, but anyways, we're going to jump right back into it. We're, gonna, we're not going to waste any more time. We're going to try to fit in all the questions into this episode if we can. It may have to be a part two, so you might, might have to wait. So I'll be back. Yes. <laughs> so now uh, let me ask, okay, again, mm -hmm. and these are all, I'm just like a kid right now asking questions that I wanted to ask back then. Okay. But I felt like, okay, I'm just here visiting. Let me just be quiet. We both was kids, so you could have <laughs> just asked me, homie. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so, so now, uh, okay, the album drops. Okay. Uh, I, this may be a goofy question, but do you remember the date that it dropped? Oh, the date. I, I know the month. Like see. on this day, they dropped. I know oh, mine dropped this in is February. I, I, just, I don't remember the exact date, but I know Living Like Us was dropped in February 1990. Uh -huh. I think it's the... I don't know, was the twenty? Is the nineteenth or twenty? Some of them days. It's, it's in there. Uh -huh. Like there's, it, it, we just had an anniversary for it. Um, uh, twenty years. Okay. Yeah, twenty years. Uh, living like hustlers. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, when that murder rap dropped in December. Okay. Of um nineteen um eighty nine. So okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that was the twelve inch cover, if yeah, I'm correct. Everybody's, everybody's on the lineup. On. Yeah, everybody's on it. And they're bringing yeah. you in. Yeah, I remember that's that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. They, I, well, they're snatching me off. Okay, they let me pick was. me out of the lineup. Okay. Yeah, which is a which is a shot from the video from Murder Rap video. Okay. Yeah, and that's a classic cover because it's, it's, it's Dr. Dre, Easy E, DOC, Laylaw, Cam G, Rest in Peace, Rest in Peace, Easy E, Cam G. Um, um, uh, me, DJ Chaos, and Go Mac. Yeah, see, that's see, the famous cover. See, those are things yeah. that I would be selling as posters. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, right. hey, hey, hey. Li living like hustlers, living like hustlers. Um, the whole nostalgia of living like hustlers is crazy because that's, you know, that's one of like the legendary records that was done in that era. Like yes. it's one of the top. I think it's the top one to pick the top fifty album of that era. Uh, it's in the top 50 i think so okay. yeah so now the album mm -hmm. drops now let me ask you this i know the answer but i have to ask you did it take off slowly or did it immediately no, it exploded off? exploded it exploded for two reasons it exploded because the momentum that i guess easy unit wa had and um after no one can do it better um the momentum that we had as ruthless records um the, the spotlight was on us another thing it was groundbreaking it was cutting you know dr dre was one of the hottest producers at the time and it just had that impact yes you know yes so, okay oh, but n nothing i mean we couldn't do nothing wrong after straight out of compton to be honest so no you're, uh, you're we absolutely do right. anything wrong uh, so. th that was probably on the West Coast, maybe even in the East Coast. Well, I'm not going to say that just yet. But okay. on the East Coast, that was probably the most talented record label out at that time. I'm I sure. think so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Both coasts. I think. Yes. I think because we change. I think Ruthless Records changed the way that the mind of Easy E, the way he changed the way people looked at underground hip hop. Yes. Uh, on a, on a grand scale, and and we were groundbreaking because we did reality rap. It wasn't called gangster rap yet, and. That's why I think we became a powerhouse because we became so successful with no radio. Okay. You know, and that's what made us a cut from everybody else. You know, before that, everyone was, they had radio records. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We never had any radio records, but we got just the same success as labels. You know, Def Jam had radio records. You know, um, <clears throat> all these other labels had radio records. Even even we say Luke was banned and everything, they still had, you know, Two Life Crew had a radio record, a band in the USA and stuff like that. But, um, we never had any radio play. None of that had radio play at all. You know what I mean? None of the ruthless stuff had radio, except for Supersonic, and it was nominated for a Grammy. Shout out to JJ Fad too. You know, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. So um, that's I think why we should be considered one of the greatest labels from that era, Absolutely. because we were highly successful without radio. Absolutely. That's we were just point. as successful as everybody else, but without radio. It's one thing we got to understand about Ruthless Records. Yes. Yeah, you know. Great point. I'm glad you said that. I'm going to share something with you, and then I'm going to ask you a question. First time, 1988, Anaheim Celebrity Theater. Yeah. I see the DLC perform. Mm -hmm. uh, I see King T. Mm -hmm. He's up there. Uh, DJ Aladdin on turntables. DJ yeah. Pooh was on the drum. Mm -hmm. Mix Master Spade was there. Right. Uh, NWA comes out and that fucking it, it show was crazy. amazing. Yeah. 
then uh, Ice-T was per- pushing his Power album. That's right, okay? yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was one show. Mm-hmm. The next one I went to, <laughs> Above the Laws there. Next year. Yes. Next year. And then they announced the record that just went gold on yeah. its way to platinum, uh-huh. okay? Yeah. But something happened there. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the discrepancy with me and Ice Cube. Yeah. yeah. Now, it, it, for, for those that may not know or never got clarification, here's what I, all I heard. Steve Yano mm-hmm. tells me, hey, man, did you hear <laughs> Steve this? Would know. Yes, Steve, Steve would Yano's know. voice. Steve goes, would know. He said, man, you know what? Ice Cube dissed above the law. Yeah, he did. You know, and yeah. I was like, for reals? And then he, but I want you to elaborate on it. Okay. What happened was, is, is we did, a, um, we had an interview with the LA Times. I record was the hottest record that was out. You know, it was in, in the top 20. Um, and... The reporter asked us what's different from you guys and other people that's out there. And um, Gomek was like, yeah, man, um, you know, we real. You know, we came up hustling. We took our dope money and, and we we created above the law. You know what I'm saying? We real street dudes. We not like Ice Cube to where like he looked at it from the outside of it, you know, and and we real. You know what I mean? Like we're real. I, I don't really think to the, to the de- degree that he said Ice Cube was fake like that. I just think it was the reality of who Ice Cube was at, the, at that particular time to us. You know, we know the facts on the streets, you know. No disrespect to O'Shea, it's cool. You know, we love Ice Cube. Yeah. Uh, and, and Ice Cube, the funny thing about it, Ice Cube was one of the first people that we befriended in NWA. We didn't, when we hung out, we hung out with Cube and Law, you know, because he used to always be around Law all the time. So we were cool with him, you know. And so um, right before the show, I remember, you know, Easy called me like, hey, man, you know, oh, boy, this y'all in the um." I said, who? He's like, Cube, go get the L.A. Times, because I guess the reporter stirred the pot. He like yes. he tried to say, like, OK, what do you got to say about that? They said this, I, you know, and at the time he was kind of one footed, you know, one foot out the door, one foot still in the door. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, you know, he was styling the fence. Cube was, he hadn't left just all the way yet. So Cube, I guess it was just out of him being mean, was like, oh, well, New Jack's from Pomona. Need to just talk about the 10 freeway because that's the only shit that's going on out there. Now, for me, I'm a street kid. You know, I'm, I'm, I hustled. I done sold dope. I done did all kinds of shit. Right. You know, um, for me, I'm like, Who's this? Who's this Buster? You know what I mean? Talking this shit to me, right. he's a Buster. So we get to the thing. He's with Rolling Stone magazine. He's coming in. He's coming to hang out with Dub and um. At the time, they were low profile. Remember Dub yeah. and DJ Aladdin. Right. Um. They were low profile. Um. So he go. He comes to hang out with them. And Tunes. And Tunes was with him too. Tunes was with with um Dub and all them. And um, so he comes in to hang out with them. We're all in the we're all in the uh, in the, in the hallway in the, in, yes. in the dressing rooms, you know, by the dress in the, in the back in the court, you know, in the area where you walk in. Yes. So I see him. So me and him exchange words. We going back and forth, and I was like, "That's some bullshit you said. What's happening?" You know what I'm saying? So for me, I'm like, I'm ready to get down. You know what I mean? Like I'm the hothead at this time. I'm like hot. Yeah. But I didn't expect to see him there. You're but right. I just remember, you know, him and Dub, they tight. You know what I mean? It's cool. So. He went to um, Dub's room. He he go in the other other dressing room. Law goes and asks him like, "Hey, can we talk?" So he bring him to my dressing room. Oh wow! Yeah. So now I'm hot. Like, what the fuck you doing in my dressing room, dude? So I take off on him. You know, and that that's how the story goes. He flew out the door. Uh, he ran in the chaos. Chaos shoved him, a sock and whatever, and then that was it. That's why the story is like he got jumped. But really, I'm the one socked him up. Right. And he didn't never get jumped. Right. You okay. Know, he that, never got jumped. Yeah. He just got socked out by me. Then straight up, you know. And I love Ice Cube. It's cool. But we, we were young and we was wilding, and you know that's how it happened. You right. know, he tried to, you know, he tried to still two step, but it didn't work for him. Right. You know. So, but at the time, I was a young high head, and that's how it went down. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then in New York, you know, take it further. In New York, they 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 were ones who started the rumor that we jumped him, or he did. We didn't ever jump him. You know. Um. We got to New York and they wanted to fight and we got into an all out brawl right in the middle of the seminar. So right. for I mean, I guess they was trying to defend his honor or something. I don't know it was between me and him. He didn't have right. nobody ever jumped him. Right. W- was know? that that scene in Spirit of the Compton? Yeah, okay. yeah. That was that, that was that was it. And then they try to label us as being like um hired henchmen for NWA mad at um Ice Cube left NWA, but it had nothing to do with personal. You know, we felt like, and you know, it stems from the beef only escalated when, you know, we wanted Cube to do the last song. Yeah. And Cube fell out with um with Easy. 
And he was like, I'm not doing nothing with Eric. Y'all, y'all dealing with Eric. Y'all, you know, but that was the plan when we was on tour. Right. That was a plan when we when we, we, we left um Strata the Compton tour to um sign. He so he knew right. it was up. Like we want you to rock with us. Like just get past it. We make sure you're paper. I ain't dealing with them. I ain't dealing, you know, he was so selfish about it. You know what I mean? And that kind of like started because we was cool. Yeah. You know, so it was animosity built up. When, so by the time we got to the celebrity, that just made it just all, you know, like right. this dude not fucking with us, man. You know, fuck this fool. You right. know, that's how we felt about it. You know, we young. We, I mean, 19 years old, 20 yeah. years old. We were young. You know, we, we just wilding in the streets, man. We're not, we not thinking about it like that, man. You know, and and like I said, I got big respect for Cube. I, yeah, Cube was one of, I, it's, it's funny, I used to be super cool with everybody, but I was more cooler with him than anybody. You know, I thought he'd be the last person to not want to, you know, Ren was always like laid back and he was like, oh, I do it, but you know, I'm over here, you know what I'm saying? But Ren ended up being like the most solidest dude out of him, you know, for out of everybody, him and, you know, beyond easy, he ended up being more solid than anybody, you know? Everybody else is kind of like, they straddle the fence a lot, when, you know, after the fact, like when, when, when business got funky, man, everybody showed their colors, man, you know, nobody want to be friends, nobody want to be bros no more, everybody want to start showing their colors, man. You know, that's what I don't, because we were really young and, you know, we did a lot of stuff and all we had to do was just get in the room and be like, hey, man, look, you go your way, I go mine. All that shit throwing, you know, saying this shit, shit talking. Eric looked out for all of us, man. And and that's, I think, what I regret in all of that, man. Like, right. I wish I would have just talked to Cube and we didn't scrap. I wish I would. You know what I mean? Like, but we was young. So I don't, I don't trip off like, you know, people trip off like what youngsters do. I used to be all these dudes, man. I used to be all these little fly dudes that's running around here. I used to be them, man. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Fresh out of the projects, fresh over here. Fresh like, so I understand what they're going through. You're like, oh, why they be acting like that? When I was 20, I act the same way. You know, when I was 19, I was acting the same way. Whole bunch of money, jewelry, big cars. I was acting the same way, you know? So I don't, yeah. you know, I get it. You know what I mean? I, that's one thing I regret about our story, you know, how we broke up over money, really. You right. know, we're good now, but... Right. You know, the the, 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 the the pain that we went through, it's really messed up, man. You know what I mean? And people die off and you can't never say what you really feel. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, it's, 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 it's really, you know, like if you take, let's take Eric and Dre's relationship, it was a strain when he died. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't, you know what I mean? Like they talk, but it wasn't mended, right. you know, back, you know, and that's type of stuff that I regret. I'm glad I'm able to like rekindle all my stuff with everybody from Cube to Dre to everybody that, you know, cause when the click split, people had to choose sides, so. Right, okay. You know, let me say for the public that's listening, but there's probably people out there our age, uh, or maybe even a little bit younger that mm -hmm. may do not know what the Anaheim Celebrity Theater was. Oh yeah. yeah. Let me say this: if you never went to an Anaheim Celebrity Theater show, you really, really missed out because mm -hmm. those are some real classic, That's classic right. shows. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the Celebrity Theater ever recorded any of those. You know? I, that'd be dope. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah, that would be dope. Yeah. Now uh, you mentioned the seminar mm -hmm. uh, new in New York, seminar. Well, new music seminar. Now the new music seminar. See. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for people that may not know, that was a battle of the DJs. That's right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People always think, uh, no, the DMC. I know that's a different. This, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the new music seminar was, I, if I'm correct, the first time I ever heard of it mm -hmm. was when DJ Joe Cooley battled Cash yeah, Money yeah, yeah. from mm -hmm. Philly. That's right. Yeah. 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 It has that. That's one aspect of it. It has panels. It had everything. It's, it, you remember we had that, and then we had Jack the Rapper. Jack the Rapper. And you know, then Atlanta. they turned into How Can I Be Down. Yes. You okay. know, and all those, all those different ones, they morphed into other stuff. You right. know what I mean? From the new music seminar. Dope. Yeah. But Dope. they were all about what you're talking about, the mix and the, 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 everything about hip hop, everything about urban music, everything, you know, it was about that. It, 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 it evolved from that. You know what I mean? Like all those other things that we see evolve from the new music seminar. Okay. You know, now, now just to uh, ask my last question about the first album, how much contribution would you say that Dre had on it? Would you say it was, uh, a small portion pretty much produced by you uh if you care to elaborate but, on i that. mean it, it, it it's um i would say 70 30. Mm -hmm. the reason why because because really creatively it's out of my mind sonically it's out of my mind you know what i mean and my partner's minds and you know my bro's mind you know what i mean so 
um, we came up with because we were already developed when we came ruthless. Like we already had, like I said, we already had like seven, eight songs done, seven done. I mean, all the rest of the ideas, like like when you say kicking lyrics, I already wrote kicking lyrics in high school. It was already done. Oh wow! You know what I'm saying? Those records were done. Me and me and Law wrote freedom of speech, and then flow on was done. Balling was done. Like I told you, just songs that were done. Um, so for us, um, for us, when I look back at it, we had. Uh, I would say like 70% of that album done. Okay. You know what I mean? So Dre contributed about 30%, but 100% of his effort was, that's what we needed. Yes. To make records on a professional level. You got to realize that demos, right. you know, they're great ideas, but you know, when you start, we start bumping things up and making records on, we hadn't made records on a serious level, you know, we made, but our records sound quality, you know, as demos, you know, some, some, I remember one time I was rolling with Warren G and, um, I played the demo for him. He's like, man, a lot of this stuff sound better than what y'all, you know, what y'all recut. And I was like, yeah, that, but that's because the essence of it, you know what I mean? Like, and and I, if I could play the demo to Living Like Hustlers, you see what I'm saying? Because it's more of a hunger, yes, like a young, hungry, you know, and that's always when you cutting, you know, that's why I learned as I started making records to keep my roughs. Yes. yes. You know, because the hunger. Yes. The hunger when you first do it, the magic, people say the magic, but it's the hunger that you have when you're young and, and that's what you're going to hear in, in people's demos. You like, sometimes you lose that in recutting it. So that's the only thing. But yeah, I mean, he had everything to do with the record because we had made a professional record. So we had to bump it up to make it sound professional. Without Dre, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Awesome. You know? Awesome. <laughs> so now, um, moving right along that album, you got to start working on an EP. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about uh, the song that I was telling you that I loved. That, oh, oh, yeah. For the, know, yeah. for the funk of it. For the funk of it. That song to me was the shit. Yeah, that song okay. was the shit. It was the shit. That song was the shit. Yeah. Okay, now I guess somebody had a, <laughs> had a question. Is that EP available today still? Yes, yeah, available. Okay. Uh, it's, it's on Sony. It's, it's available. I, I don't, I'm not sure what it is. I, I think um, Vocally Pimping is on, um, maybe on Amazon somewhere. You just got to pull it up. I'm okay. pretty sure it's available. Okay, I mean, it's too epic. It's okay. too epic, so I know they're still selling it. <laughs> okay. Now, yeah. uh, when I had asked you about your second album, I know you said your second album was... Uh, Black, Black Mafia Life. Yeah. Yes. I, but my second a... record is Vocally Pimp, which is an EP. Right. Okay. So, yeah, it was a lot of people don't know about it because it's an EP. It's like a four-song EP. Yeah. yeah. I remember Steve uh, brought me two of those, and of course, I used to DJ, right? Yeah. I love that yeah. shit. Yeah, for the funk of it, it's dope, yes. man. Because I, I remember the way you kicked it off. Now, here's another one that you can bang. I'm, I'm the million, million dollar nigga, not the million dollar man, man G. G. I'm like a bitch like glass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your voice, bro. Your voice yeah. was, was, was awesome. Bro. Thank you, man. So yeah. now, let's get into Black Mafia uh, album. Okay. Yeah. Before the interview, we were talking about how that was the template for uh, yeah, G Funk. G -Funk. Yeah, as it's a G Funk it. template. Actually, it's it's actually vocally pimping is the precursor in Black Mafia Life. Is it full blown? Because we walk you into um, that. We kind of like because you got to realize we come from boom bap break beats to slow flow fly funky. <sighs> You know what I mean? California <laughs> palm trees bump. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's G funk, yeah. and that's what people don't understand. You know what I mean? Let this. Let me. Let, let me let you, let you understand. Yeah. It's not Parliament Funkadelic. It's fly palm trees bump. Slow the groove down. We gonna sing a little bit. We gonna let it marinate. Slick. Boom. We gonna. You know. We gonna see California right now. Right. That's what G funk is, and that's what we were doing coming out of living like hustlers into vocally pimping into black mafia life that's why black mafia life is super funky singing fly drop the top groove you know what i mean it's that everything is slowed down yeah. vsop got a slump wah, boom, wah, boom, wah, boom, bang. we coming through slamming you know what i mean yes, <laughs> and yes. that's g-funk that's the whole template that's my whole theory in it you know it, it's taking it's taking like it's taking knee deep and slowing it down. Boom, 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 boom. You know, she, yeah. which is never missing the beat, which end up being Dre Day. Yes. You know what I mean? I could break the records down to you because you a DJ, so you dig it. Yeah. You know what I mean? A lot of other places, they don't understand what we're talking about, but I can right. break these records down for you. Right. You know, it's that, it, that's what it was, you know, and that, that, be, that became the blueprint. And when you look at, a producer, a producer only has this theory. I tell people all this time. I tell I tell students this. You know, they come out of um, um, the music institute. 
They're like, oh, uh, uh, can you be taught how to be a producer? Not if you don't have a theory. Right. Can I have a theory? Yeah. Dre has a theory. I have a theory. We have theories. G Funk was one of my theories. Let's fuse this with this with all this other music. I don't give a fuck if it's a banjo on it. We gonna make it funky. <laughs> and we gonna put this on top of it and we gonna put this and it's gonna make it be like this. And when it's slump, that's gonna make it G Funk. That was my theory. Right. You know, now I had no problem with that theory. So I play a demo at, I play a demo, well I play the scale of the album and let me let people understand when I say the scale. Okay. The scale of the album means that it's the, from one to 10, it's how the album is gonna progress and it's the whole theory of it. It's everything that it, th that's is about. It's this whole scale, it's not the demo because we making records. Yes. So I play the scale at Appetite for Destruction video you know, so now you know living, so now you know niggas for life is out right now, and Dr. Dre is still in NWA, so this is way before the chronic. Understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to give you a time now. Yes. So I play it for him. He's like, "What's that, man?" I said, "Yeah, you know, man, that sound, the sonic's crazy, man." I'm like, "Yeah, this the sirens and eh, all the crazy little keyboards and shit." You know, he's like, "Yeah, it's crazy, man. What you call it?" I said, "That's you know, we call it like G funk, man. You know, it's gonna, we're gonna slow everything down. We're just gonna slump. We're gonna just California gonna open up like that. You know what I'm saying for everybody." So, moving forward, we get ideal froze because Dre's out the door. Yeah. Maybe about two months later, two, three months later. We on ice. The record's on ice. Niggas for life is out of going. It's crazy. Every other day. But he's out the door. They start developing whatever they were developing at Death Row. Going back and forth. It's about seven, eight months, nine months go by, right? Me and Easy, we rolling. He said, meet me up at Priority. So I meet him up at Priority Records. We picking up the demo to the chronic. <laughs> I put, we put it in, let's see what he's talking about. Boom, 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 knee deep, slow down. Let me ride, it's pimp clinic. All this shit, I'm like, can you believe this shit? The motherfucker used the theory. Yeah. And it drops, right? Okay, no problem. He the homie, we let it ride. Because it's a business deal and I'm mad as fucking easy right now. Right. I'm looking at him sideways. Like, so you gonna put this shit? I said, man, I don't got no choice. I'm making 25%. It's it's cake, man. This shit gonna be cake. We're gonna walk through. I said, man, this dude finna kill us, man. Sure enough, he they get coined as doing as G Funk, as being being the um people who created and innovated G Funk and originally it came from us. Now when Black Mafia Life comes out and it mirrors it, now people are like, hmm. Wait a minute, that's interesting. But we can't combat it because now the chronic's commercial. Yeah. So I will say this, in hindsight, I was pissed off. Now, I mean, back then I was pissed off in hindsight, I could say like, okay, Dr. Dre, Snoop, all y'all, they end up making G-Funk a household name, you know? And then when Regulated Record came out, that kind of solidified everything, you yeah. know. So to uh, to take the sound on a way way commercial level, you know what I'm saying? And it'd be labeled as a G funk record as well. But all it is is that it's just a it, it's just a theory that I had to fuse all these different types of music together and put singing and melody and all this so other stuff over it. Just as a young producer, and and the crazy thing about you know the the thing that I was doing when I was at Ruthless Records as a producer trying to create G funk along with my colleagues, you know, my brothers, I, I wanted to be different than NWA. I yeah. didn't want to have a boom in the bap sound with hardcore lyrics. I wanted to have a more fly California vibey type of sound of music and still do hardcore lyrics. And that's the birth of it, you know. Um, and, 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 and since I'm a musician, that's why I don't have any hangups about it because I know music is an influence. So I'm glad that that's, that's what they say. That's the greatest compliment, right? When yeah. people emulate your stuff, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Integrate their stuff into your stuff. So it's a great compliment for me as a young producer for, for Dre to even be influenced by what I was doing. So, wow. yeah, yeah. yeah. But that VSOP, now let me ask you this. Did you do mm -hmm. that on the SP-12 or an MPC? I did that on the MPC. Okay. I did the whole record on the MPC. At, the funny story about the MPC is that I learned the MPC first. Really? Yeah, I was the one who, it used to sit at Donovan's on the floor. Nobody wanted to fuck with it. So when they was doing Niggas for Life, I used to be like, man, when we gonna get on the second Above the Law album? 
So I found my own studio. Um, and then Dre was like, I was like, man, I need a drum, man. He was like, man, use that, man. Learn it and then let me know what's up with it. So I went and learned the shit verbatim, bro. Everything like in two days and start snuffing on that bitch. And then, <laughs> and that's what you got. I did that whole record on, on that. I did the whole record on, I did the whole record on that. I did every every record moving forward on the SP, I cool. mean, on the um, MPC. You yeah. know, one thing I didn't like about the MP was because, let, let's just say you had a boom, ba -cap, boom, 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 yeah. boom, uh -huh. You hit that motherfucker three times, boom, 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 I couldn't stand that. You can't, you keep, you keep, um, Dump it over. I was wondering. Yeah, it wouldn't stop. It, it wouldn't don't, stop. It don't have a. It don't have that like like the SP twelve have it. It stops right. when you let up. When you hit it, right, it rolls over. Yeah. You know what I loved about BSOP mm -hmm. the way you used Eugene's love. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that mm -hmm. shit was hard, yeah. bro. Yeah. You took like pretty much every classic song and made yeah. one song. Yeah, you know, yeah. Mm, yeah, that shit was mm. hard, dude. Yeah, yeah me and my man HB, me and my, one of the musicians on that, one of the producers, uh, on that, one of the writers on, on um, on that. He came up with the fusion. He came up with that fusion, you know, with that kind of like taking this little piece and taking that little piece, and you know that kind of thing. Um, and then the drums, the Daryl Hall and John yeah, Oates yeah, album, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because like I was around a lot of great guys who. You know, which I gave him that credit, you know, what I mean? <laughs> but me as a visionary, I always knew that you get the best people around you to make you to get the best musicians and the best minds around you to make the hottest shit. So, right. yeah. Right. And, and you give them the credit, you know, what I mean, so I had no problem with that. But yeah, that that's that that's what I use at the MPC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, uh, true or false? Warren G lived with you? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 How did that come about? Well, at the time, he uh, I guess he got into it with um, with his parents, which is a Dre mom and his dad. And um, he, at the time, Michelle was um, Michelle and Dre was living together. Right. And I guess they had just moved into the new house or whatever. He's like, "Hey, man, won't you let won't you let Warren come stay with you?" I was like, "I don't got no problem with it." We was actually recording living our cousins at the time, so I was like, "I don't got no problem with it." You know, he was with us every day anyway at the studio, so it was like. Hey, come stay with us. Yeah. So he came and stayed with us, man. And, and and he stayed with us and from from the beginning of that I, I mean, he stayed with us through the whole time. We made a record, all that, you know. Would yeah. you say uh is it safe to say he was influenced? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he you know, he told you on his documentary, yeah, he, yeah. That, that's what G Funk come from, us. You know, that's how he was influenced, you know, for me, along with above the law, you know, cuz he used to stay with us, yeah. And that that's what people don't know and in the I'm the you know, Snoop was signed to me first, you know, and the reason why he was signed to me, um, I had 213 first, you know, I had all of them wow. that I was going to develop them, but I had Snoop signed first um, because um, I guess he was in YA or somewhere or in the county, he had, something had happened with him and, and he was away and he was like, man, y'all you, need to sign my boy Snoop, you need to listen to him, Hush, you need to listen to him. So as soon as he came out, shoot, he came to the studio, we dropped some tracks and, and he was in, he was in, he was phenomenal, you know what I mean, at a very young age. So we wanted to do something with him. The crazy part about it is that everything broke apart, so okay. we wasn't able to do it. So then Dre came to me, I guess, I guess Warren took him over to Dre when we got kind of like, we couldn't move forward because you know, the breakup and nobody really wanted, you know, it's kind of like the, this half went over here and this other half would go over there. And he was like, you know, so Dre came over to me and was like, look, man, you know, I want to I want to sign Snoop. You know, I know you working with him. Is that cool? You know, I was like, yeah, man, that's cool, man. Dude's incredible, man. Y'all, you know, y'all spread your wings. Y'all do what you got to do. You know what I mean? Like, and, and that's why I try to explain to people about Dre never stole nothing from me. He just was influenced by me. I don't, Dre's my friend. I don't want to get into that narrative. He's right. my friend. He's my brother. You know what I mean? He put me in a game. He's one of my biggest inspirations besides my father and my uncle. So I don't want to get, he's influenced by that. I don't, I don't want, you know, people always trying to make a hot, hot line on it or something. Right. You know what I mean? But he was just influenced by me as a young producer. And that's how the G-Funk got, destroyed. just like I influenced Warren. It's the same way. You know what I mean? We all influence each other. I was influenced by him. A lot of stuff he does, he was influenced by me. So, and that's how that happened, yes. you know. Rest in peace, Nate Dog too, man. You know yes. And Nate Dog was one of your young soldiers that came through, man. And he was on, he was singing on, uh, Nate Dog is singing on uh, on Vocally Pimping. 
Oh, yeah, okay. He's singing on there. He's, he's doing background vocals for us. You know, he's a young, he's an incredible <laughs> dude too, man. Well, <laughs> not only did you influence Warren G and Dr. Dre, but let me tell you mm -hmm. something. You also influenced a lot of Chicanos. Okay. A lot of Chicanos. I like that. Um, <laughs> we're going to come back. We're going to touch on Black Superman. Okay. And I want you to break that down uh, okay. for us. And then we're going to talk about, um, I am going to ask you the Toker question. Everybody's been asking about okay. the Toker question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll okay. come back to that for a 10-minute break. Yeah. So once again, everybody, uh, we're right here with Hudge, Code 187, Above the Law, breaking it down, G-Funk in the motherfucking house. So call somebody, text somebody, slap the shit out of somebody, go there get you go. yourself a beer, <laughs> and uh, right let them know that... <laughs> Big Hutch is in the motherfucking building. Be back.
and we heard about this young kid from the harbor area named Tony A. And he was a DJ, you know what I'm saying? He was going in with, with the big with the big stars, you know what I'm saying? And he was like one of us going in and infiltrating inside of all these MCs, you know what I'm saying? A rodeo mixtape is just mixed of different types of music, no matter what genre it is. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's like a, like making your own musical movie. When La Raza came out, man, I just, even the amount of sales of the single of La Raza that got moved out of the rodeo was, it was crazy, bro. And that song just got played and it was played in all the stands over there. And I was blessed to go back one time, even to see it. And I want to say in 91 or 92. Although they were not black, they were Oriental, Asian, whatever you want to call them. They, they were cool and they embraced everybody, blacks, Latinos, whoever came to, came to the swap meet the want to buy music, they were record people. Justin, one, two, one, two, right about now, Easy e and Dr. Dre's in the motherfucking house. Times are getting crazy, it's really hard to choose it. The Rhodium's a spot to get funky, fresh music, easy motherfucking E, and my homeboy Dr. Dre, MC Ren is in effect, and you know we don't play. The Rhodium is hitting, but you know you can't leave, until you get a deaf ass tape from Steve. Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape. Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape. Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape. Oh Steve, oh Steve, oh Steve, just give me just one more tape. Yeah, man, I came all the way down. Man, like the NWA and Easy E music hit the Rhodium Swap Meet mixtapes first. Like when we dropped our records, man, it was like it was cool putting your records out, but even though people knew who Dre was and I was and Cube and Yella before, they didn't really know who Easy was. But not until you know Boys in the Hood and some of that you know Fat Girl and LA is the place that stuff hit the mixtapes, man. That's what kind of put it out there for people to know, like, what is this Easy e and what is this NWA thing? So I think it was like a big, big push. The Rhodium Swap Me uh, mixtapes had a huge impact on, on hip hop and the hip hop culture because it was different. And, um, you know, wasn't nobody doing it like that. You know, you had New York, they was doing mixtapes, but, you know, you had NWA who was saying whatever the fuck they wanted to say. Motherfuckers wasn't doing that shit, speaking how they wanted to speak, you know? And what that did was was open up a, a lane for uh, what they call gangster rap today and, and the hip hop culture. And uh, it really it really opened up lanes for, for, you know, pretty much for the West Coast gangster shit to get out. and. Uh, Nobody else was doing that, and it was just different. And, and people were scared to say what the what they wanted to say. And uh, you know, that buzz came from Steve at the Rodium Swap Meet. You know, uh, working with Dre and Easy, and, and created a, a whole plethora of good music, <laughs> uh, and and it, it created a lot of uh, lanes and opened up a lot of lands from artists like myself to be able to come out you know i'm i'm part of the uh the, the tree i'm a branch on the tree that that dre and easy started you know and then on my branch you got snoop the dog pound uh 50 cent eminem and all of those guys you know that that's all on my branch the chronic and uh that's what it created man Welcome back, everybody, to Rodian Radio, episode 48, and I'm sitting here with Black Superman. We're going to go ahead and jump right back into it, yeah. and I actually served them a shot, so uh, uh, let us toast to, toast to uh, uh, Above the Law, Co-187, Hutch. MG. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, may rest in peace, rest brother. Rest in peace, brother. Stay blessed. I'm going to sip on mine, because if not, I'll get all fucked up real fast. I'm, I'm a lightweight, so I... And I got myself a well, Corona. I had to break, break bread, you know, my yes. first time on the Rodium, Rodium Radio, so. Um, no. So now, you know. I want to talk about the producing side of okay. 
Black Superman. Okay. What keyboard, uh, what drum machine did you use to create Black Superman? Oh, that's the, that's the MPC. MPC, okay. Yep. Um, like I said, moving on, moving forward. The boards on it is, um, you know, 106. Um, that was my main board. Um, and um, a bunch of great musicians. I okay. mean, the, we didn't use, and the funny thing about the um, me and um, Jimmy Russell, we didn't use, which you did the vocal order with me, me and both did the vocal order. We used the, um, we didn't use the talk box. We used right. the, we used the vocal order. That was my next you question. Know? Yeah, we used the talk box. We, I just, I just tweaked it. I just EQ'd it to sound like the talk box. But we used the, um, the vocal order. Remember the module? I forget what company made that module. It was a, it was a rack mount. Yes. It was a rack mount, they call a vocal order. And we use that, but you still had to um, you you still had to do the mic and all that, but it's just not the box. Not, uh, like uh, later, I did I did a lot of stuff with the um, talk box, but on that particular record, I used the vocoder, you know, the module, because I think that's what we had at, at the studio. At, um, and we did that at the Edge Recording Studio. We did um, all of um, um, Uncle Sam's Curse there. You know, because oh. that's because I couldn't because I, I, easy, easy had the studio tied up between me fighting with him and bone. I w wanted my own studio. Uh -huh. So I ended up getting my own studio. And that was at um, the Edge recording studio in Inglewood, California. OK. So, and then we started doing everything there. And um, yeah, that's why Black Superman came along. And Black Superman is the last record that we cut on the record. You know. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was the last record. And it's funny because easy E picked that single. We wanted um, California to be the single, you know, we wanted California to be the first single because the record was coming out in the summer. We felt like it would be a great summer banger. Right. Um, but Easy said, since we had, I, I played the whole record for him, you know, the whole scale of the record. And I was like, I just mixed this record called Black Superman. He's like, what? It's like, okay, check it out. <laughs> so after the siren, I mean, after the uh, strings go down, da, 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 he said, and so we in that smoking, you know, we smoking big. He's like, that's y'all single. I said, what? How are we going to do a single called Black Superman? He was like, man, I'm telling you, that's y'all single. He said, because what you want to do with this album, since it's a uh, Uncle Sam's Curse was a was a gangster political record. Yeah. It was like if you took P.E. and N.W.A. and made a record together, you get right above the law, Uncle Sam's Curse, because it was a gangster political record. It's yeah. like we went from one extreme like NWA to another extreme like PE did, you know, so we put it all together. He said, what we have to do with this record, unlike, you know, the last record, um, which had VSOP leading off, he's like, this record, what we want to do is we want to show everybody what statement that you're trying to make it's a statement record it's not like a it's not like oh this is a fun no it's got a statement because the record was really political yes you know what i mean but it was gangs it was a twist to it you know yeah. what I'm saying? it's really that's an that's my favorite record that we ever that i ever produced is is my favorite record is legends but um production wise the favorite my favorite record producing would be uncle sam's curse so he was like that's gonna that one song is gonna explain who you who you guys actually are on this album okay he picked that record and i tell you one thing it's the best record we've ever did it's the one we got it's a critically acclaimed record for us it's the biggest the only reason why black i'll tell you the story the only reason why black superman didn't go pop is because it was called black superman and they pop radio told us that they're not going to play a record called black superman because at that time you know what I mean? Of course. It, it, you know, it's it, it's racism, dog. It's, it's, it it's the ninety three. You know? There you go. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's offensive. You know, yeah. to, to pop radio and because it, it it had done everything it could do in urban radio. It was a big record. Yes, it was. You know, it was a cold classic, and it was also for its mainstream R and B radio. It was a hit. You know, so it done everything. So when we approached pop radio, they said we couldn't play it, and 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 that's funny to me because. Every record that we tried to go, that we tried to approach radio with, we never could get radio. Like when we came to the to the point to where we could push VSO because it was a club record. Yeah, you know what I mean. We was like, okay, yeah, we can possibly get this on the radio. We fought hard for it. Black Superman, it was just easy, bro. Yeah, it was easy. We approached when we approached Urban Radio it was easy. So, so um, that's the that's the crazy thing about Black Superman that, that Black Superman I almost said it was an accident, but it's more organic. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it was a record that I didn't really take a lot of time in doing. You know what I mean? Like as a producer, like a lot of records I will take a lot of time in doing. Like 
um, when I did um, Uncle Sam's Cursed, you know, um, a lot of records on there, Set Free, um, a lot of those records that I was producing took me nights and nights and nights. Black Superman was one of the records that came instantly. Wow. You know what I mean? Like it was instantly. Okay. You know, um, the drums, the drums are um, second to none drums. They're the second to none drums. It's and and people know this now, but it's funky worms spent backwards. Right. That me doing backward shit. <laughs> the, the beat is that's funky worm. That's da, 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 spent backwards. So you've been doing that yeah. shit since day one, bro. Exactly. So that's my theory. That's another theory as a producer. Me spinning that backwards. So it it was a very simple record. It's just the break beat. And and uh, funky worm going backwards, and then me over the top doing boards and strings and all that shit over the top of it. Wow. Very simple record. Like it's a very simple record, and and I think that's when my dad, you know, funny thing about my dad, my dad taught me that he's like, man, the, the, and, and you know, Dre used to always have a saying, and it's always been in my, it's always been in my family, simple works, and Dre yes. used to say simple sales, when simple sales, you know, like keep it simple. Yes. You know, Dre used to always tell me, keep it simple. Like, you know, so so when I start approaching doing music, I always said, even though it's going to be complex, I'm going to always remember my dad and Dre, like, you know, keep it simple. And that's you one know. of the quotes that I, I re always remember Dre saying. Yeah. Simple sales. Simple sales. Yeah. Keep yeah. it simple. My dad used to always say, keep it simple, man. You know, look out the window. That's a hit. That's what my dad taught me. Like, you know, a hit is out the window. So I think that that mirrored who people were so much. Black Superman mirrored everybody who they were so much that that's. My dad telling me, look out the window, keep it simple. It's right there. The yeah. hit's right out the window. Dre saying, keep it simple. It's right there. You know what I mean? Awesome. It's proven. You know what I'm saying? That's proven. That's a proven theory, man. Big I, song. Okay, you know, yeah. now, if you were to ask me, Tony, which one's your favorite above the law, I would have to say the first four, but the second one obviously is the, the EP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first four. Right, right, right. But this now, funky. if you had to twist my arm, pick one, I would have to say living like hustlers. Oh, okay. Sim simply because. Yeah. I remember Dre played murder rap. And you're a part of it. Yes. You're a part of it. Yes. yes. You're so, a part of the DNA of it. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. And so now uh, that. Because that's energy. All that's energy. Like yes. You see it in the embryo stage. Just, you have more of a relationship with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Intimately. Now, yeah. On the Black Superman album cover, mm -hmm. if I'm correct, was that the cartoon album cover? No. The cartoon album cover is Black Mafia Life. Okay. Um, It's funny because when <laughs> Toon. Shout out to Toon, man. Um, the greatest, greatest tattoo artist, greatest artist I ever, the greatest artist I ever met. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm saying in my era, man, like he's our Picasso, you know, hip hop. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's funny. He drew that out of his head. The neighborhood watch dude. Yeah. Me and KMG, we wanted a neighborhood. Me and KMG and DJ Cavs was like, hey, man, what if we come up with like a, a neighborhood watch dude? And he he was. <laughs> over there <laughs> and then like a day later cartoon said hey Holmes came back with it it's like damn that shit is dope yeah it's like a gangster that's a neighborhood watch gangster yeah <laughs> yeah dope. that's dope. all in the mind of cartoon yeah that's it, all in the mind of cartoon black mafia life is all him it, it, yeah. in the in the documentary i told people cartoon uh actually uh gives you guys a shout out he said yeah above the law approaches me for an album cover and he goes man and i'm in a fucking above the law fan yeah he goes yeah. to be working with those guys yeah. he said at that point that's when i knew i was in the music industry yeah so yeah. tune that's all tune that cover is all him though man that covers is out of his head we, we just said well we want to we want to make us look like a neighborhood watch yes you yes. know he came back with he just scratched it out from what we were saying in our head came back two days later said check it out like, wow. damn, that shit's dope. You know, it's funny. When I saw that album cover, the first thing that came to my mind was mm -hmm. the opposite. Your neighborhood better watch out. That's dope. I like that. You know what I'm I saying? Like that. Yeah. that was dope. Now, yeah. now, <laughs> that, now, let me say this. Mm -hmm. um, Black Superman has been sampled by a lot of Chicanos. They no were doubt. girls, no doubt. guys, yeah, yeah, all yeah. rapped yeah, over yeah, 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 yeah. it. Okay. And a lot of other rappers. So, <laughs> <laughs> abroad. Yes. So. <laughs> We're going now, ahead. speaking about Chicanos, I uh -huh. have to ask you the mm -hmm. Toker question. Okay, uh, how did you meet Toker? Okay, I met I met Toker through Easy. Um, I, I used to see these cats come up to the studio, and at the time, Brownside was already developed. At okay. the time, they were already together, and I said always, you know, with, with me and I was, he would be like, meet me here, meet me there, and I would always see these these um, Chicano dudes. I'm like, who is these dudes, man? You know, they come with big webs. They look super cool as fuck. You know, I love hustlers. You know what I mean? He's like, hey, man. And so I, he'll introduce me to Toker and Danger, rest in peace, Junior, all in the whole clique. 
And, and so um, I was like, yeah, I like them dudes. And, and he was like, man, I want to put you with them. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I was like, sure, man. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I had just, I think at the time I was actually either de developing Smile Now, Cry Later for Frost. Uh -huh. So I already was, I already was trying to, because Easy's Easy's mission was to really support Chicano rap. Okay. You know, it's a big thing that we wanted to do with, at Ruthless Records. We wanted to have a division with nothing but Chicano rap, Ruthless Chicano. Um, so that was our next step. Okay. Well, you know? What do you think that Easy wanted to move in that route? I think one was, he, he always tell me, man, you know, we have big support from them and we got to definitely support them, you know. And I, I, I thought he, I, I think he felt like it's like it mirrored us. Okay. You know, like, 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 like they have something to say, like we got something to say. And he was a visionary. So he saw that. He saw, and I think with him, it, it, it's a tragedy for Chicano rap and, and not saying that the guys were successful because I think he would have made it on a powerhouse level because he's a visionary. Yes. He would have actually knew how to line it up, dress it up and make it be really official to where it's like, now when you kind of look at it, it's kind of like everybody kind of like, it's like vigilante world. Like he would have structure, like just like he did for us. You know, I think he wanted to do Chicano rap the same way, like he did for us with, with Ruthless Record, how he structured us up and made us like household. Okay. You know what I mean? This is vision. It takes a vision. It takes a visionary. And when that's why when we when we start working with Kid Frost and we start working with, with Brownside um on the on the first record, he knew exactly who he wanted how he wanted to do it. And so he put me with him and then we created East Side Drama, you know, and the rest is history. Yeah. You know, and then we formed a great relationship, you know, from it and moving forward. So yeah, uh -oh. that's how we met. We we just met just being, you know, and we're kind of on the same me, me talker and danger was kind of on the same wavelength. We were street kids coming up, you know what I'm saying? And, and we wanted to do music, you know, from that perspective, we want to talk about what the fuck we want to talk about. Yeah. So it was easy for us when we got in the studio and did East Side Drama. So yeah. okay. it was like a, you know, uh, nice how was your uh, relationship with him? Did you guys talk all the time? All the time, yeah, okay. all the time, man. It's my bro, man. Rest in peace. Man, it's my bro, man. I mean, and he was really close with him and Eric was really tight and me and Eric was really tight. So we all talked all the time, man. And we kept our relationship going on till the end, Dope. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, now, now I'm going to ask you about your relationship with Eric, because mm -hmm. when me, High C, Quick, Second Ten on AMG, mm -hmm. when we started touring and doing a lot of shows, mm -hmm. I would always see you with Eric That's all right. the yeah. time. Yeah. Now, correct, <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I might have mm -hmm. just saw a white jacket, but... <laughs> <laughs> but but did you ever carry like a straight jacket or something like to on stage? I I I would always see you wearing a white jacket. Nah, and for some reason I go because I know I, I saw just like white. <laughs> yeah, I saw one picture where Easy E was in a straight like jacket. Yeah, I so like, I thought maybe he's carrying. I don't know. Nah, nah, just like white jackets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so now let me ask you this: as far as yours and Easy relation, yeah. Did, uh, can you just share a little bit? Cause you know what, rest in peace, Easy's no longer here. No doubt, I have man. a picture right outside yeah, man. Yeah, of him. Yeah, yeah. But uh, can you just share? My biggest, like I say, as, as you know, my biggest, my biggest inspiration would be like my father. You know what I'm saying? Yes. But beyond that, will probably be my biggest influence. Is you want a little bit more, man? Yes, sir. You uh -huh. know, but my biggest influence is Easy E. Right. The reason why is because what I was able to do with Easy E was this: I was able to meet a person who that I had big respect for as a business person. And I had bigger respect for as I know him as a person. Yeah. You know, let me explain to you why. Here's the thing about an Easy E. Easy E took me from hustling in the streets to making hit records. But within that, he confined in me as a human being to where, like, he would tell me certain things, like how to make me progress as a young player in, in life. Yeah. You know, like what to do, how to navigate, how to move, how to how to handle myself, how to be the consummate businessman, how to be the consummate person and how to be the consistent person, like with how you deal with people. You know what I mean? And always give people a shot. You know what I mean? If you have an opportunity, give them an opportunity. You know what I mean? And, and my relationship with him with him was. Was really strong because we we're, not, we're very stubborn the same way and we're going to say it how it is. Right. You know, so we're, we have a lot in common when it comes to that. But um, our relationship was really, really cool because one thing I could say about Eric was Eric always championed people that were better than him. 
Mm. He didn't have this, like people be like, oh, he got ego, he got this. He did, really didn't have that. Seven when it came to chicks, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he really didn't have an ego when it came to like, he never felt it. And the funny thing about him, he never felt that he always felt like he needed all of us more than we needed him. And really we needed him because he was the visionary. You know, he took the risk, right. you know, and he would always tell me like, you know, I'm just a good idea, man. You guys are the talent, man. You guys, he always told me that you're the talented one. You're the one that's gifted, man. Not me. Right. You know, without you, without you, I don't have it. You know what I mean? Right. I don't have any. He always was, he always was honest with me, man, about everything, man. That's why I, I love Easy E so much, man, because Easy E was always honest with me, man. Easy E wasn't a person that, you know, Easy E wasn't a person that kind of flipped the script. Like I would say, like I understood what what Dre had to do, right? You know, but Easy E stayed consistent with me, man. When when Easy stepped in, it was like, you know, I can't lose you. Right. I can lose Dre. I can't lose you. You know what I mean? Like he right. told me that, like, like he, you know, he, cause he knew who I was as the, as the individual, as the person, as a human being, like, okay, this guy's a good dude. This guy's got a good heart. This dude, you know what I mean? He, he just knew me and he, he just, at a young age, man, he took me under his wing and I learned so much from him, man, that I practice every day. You know what I'm saying? From EZE, man. Like, you know, you got, you guys don't realize, man, my biggest, my biggest hurdle about Easy E is that people don't give him enough credit for being a person who, without him, there's not a lot of this industry that's going on, man. Like, yeah. people people are like, you know, they like, oh, he the rapper that died from AIDS. No, he's one of the most prolific geniuses in our era. When you talk about the 90s, no one's influenced no for east coast or west coast more than eric Wright, man no one has man i don't i don't he's my friend i don't i don't you know you don't see me post and stuff these are my people man i don't do that i don't you know when 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 i don't post pictures when i'm at a dre house i don't post post pictures. i don't these are my friends so for me I, you know when it was certain things i just follow things and look at things but for him i don't like how people don't represent easy e like he's supposed to be represented you know, because he's the reason why we exist. It, there's no Dr. Dre billionaire. There's no Ice Cube, the movie star slash the movie executive without the play that he made. You know, those guys are brilliant, man. Those guys are brilliant, man. But without Easy es vision, we don't have us, man. We don't have this. Not me, the business. I'm a businessman now. I still make music. I have brands. I have all those. The reason why you see me moving how I move is because of what Eric taught me. Yeah. My daddy didn't teach me that. My daddy's a great guy, you know, rest in peace. But he didn't teach me that. He's, he taught me that, yeah. you know? Yeah. So he's a, he's a man that, that I, I I can't even explain to you the stuff that he taught me just at a young age, man. Yeah. You know? He, you know. And he was young. He was a young guy, y'all. Everybody got to know. Easy E wasn't that old. That That's his, dem his demise. That, that's how he got in trouble. Like, he did because he was so young and he, naive, really. He didn't know. He didn't know what he had. Right. He didn't know what to follow. He didn't know whether to follow the homies or follow Jerry Heller. He didn't know. He just knew, okay, he just followed what he thought was politically right. You right. Know? You, know, you know, one thing that I've always said this, mm -hmm. I've always gotten upset because many people, when they mention legends that have passed away, no disrespect to them, they start at Tupac, Biggie, and then up. That's right. And I've always said, wait, well, what the fuck ever happened to Easy? That's right. Like, And I, I've always represented that because... I had opportunities where uh, I was able to go into the studio audio achievement and mm -hmm. see them record. Yep. Uh, uh, and then what Easy would come over, rap on my mixtapes. Mm -hmm. Not too many people can say Easy, you know, Dre, LA Dre, rest in peace, you know, no, no will come to yeah. my house. Yeah. You know, and I was mm -hmm. one of those few, so I'm very thankful for that. But I have to give credit where credit is doing. Right. It has to be given to easy. Now, That's right. Me too. I mean, industry, when you talk about industry, like I tell people all the time, and I'm not just on my West Coast. I'm talking about the reason why you have the surgeons of all of these people rapping from their hood, their projects, their boroughs. Everything. It's because of what Straight Outta Compton and Easy Does It done. Yes, it's that vision of why you can keep it real, beyond real, and how they how his vision his vision made it household. Yes. You know, on everybody's level. Not just the West Coast, hip hop in general. Hip, you know, people people brag and boast about hip hop. Hip hop was about to go into a dormant state before Easy E and the WA came along. Now that's just facts. Period. Me and you were there. Yeah. Period. Awesome. It was starting to turn into some real candy, sugar coated, <laughs> about to flow into some R and B shit. Yes. All the way, not sprinkled around like it is now. But here comes Easy E and the WA. That's that man's vision. 
Awesome. You know, awesome. You know, a lot of Latinos, and I know I'm speaking for all of them, mm -hmm. we all love Easy. Okay. And we actually even see Easy, and I'm just. I'm just being real. We almost see him like a saint in a sense. Yeah, in a no sense doubt. He, he was. Pioneer. He was. He was. You know? you know, here, here, here's what I'll say, Tom. Let, 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 let's lay it on the table. Okay. Most of these guys who you see from above the law all the way up to, say, Bone Thugs and Harmony, if you say, okay, above the law, DOC, all the NWA, Michelle A, um, Cocaine, Bone Thugs and Harmony, all these artists that we're going to say that are they're legendary right yes. okay now if you take easy e out of that we're just kids that trying to find our way you know what i mean and yeah. probably never impacting the game so when you look at what he's done he's an humanitarian because he took all these street kids and made them into household names yes you see what i'm saying yes that's what see my thing is when I look at people and they, because something is more popular and is more politically correct, who did the work? Who took the risk? He did. Yeah. On all of these people, Will I Am, which is the Black Eyed Peas. Yes. All these different people that he were was setting forth to in, to to actually put his money on the table for, to see them become these major players, which they would have became. And as you see, all of us became that. Yeah. He took that risk, you know. And that's what people don't rule in when it comes to Easy. I could say Tupac. Me and Tupac was good friends. Yeah. I could say that. It's cool. But he didn't impact people directly more than easy e because yeah. you don't have a dr dre a ice cube the above the laws the on up to the 50 cents the eminems the kendrick lamars that's because of easy e play yeah. it's not because of tupac and tupac was my very dear friend i take no cut off him he's prolific he's very legendary he's all those things yes. you know but when you talk about the things and we talk about the industry moving up to where we're at today that's because of a play that Easy E made. Yes, sir. So dope, dope. So <laughs> <laughs> Dre leaves ruthless, mm -hmm. and then as you were telling me, you became, if you will, the Dre of yeah, ruthless. Exactly, the yeah, liaison. Like because all Dre was was his liaison of of the label. So I became the liaison of Easy E. Yeah. And at that time, uh, who was signed to? Um, okay, we had Bone Thugs and Harmony, Cocaine, HWA. Um, above the law. Um, who else was on there? Um, um, Yo Moa Marquis. Um, Menage a Trois. Um, I'm not sure if JJ Fat made it still been signed too. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I think that was a roster then. Yeah, that was a roster. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, Blood of Abraham. Um, Pistol. Um, Terry B. Uh, Terry B. A lot of people forget about her. Yeah, I've been trying to get a hold of her. And I know yeah. she's doing her I own mean, music. I haven't seen that. Being yeah, I, I think, yeah. and I say mm -hmm. I think she yeah. may be doing mm -hmm. like some rock or some type yeah, of different exactly. Type yeah, exactly. Yeah, music. Yeah. But so that's kind of the core of everything. I think I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm leaving anybody out. Yeah, that's yeah. about it. Yeah, a lot of people mm -hmm. may not know that Terry B. Was a white girl signed. She's a white white rapper. Yeah, I produced her too. Yeah. Dope. Uh, to ruthless. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Dope. That's yeah. just dope. So, so now. Um, uh, I, I know we're kind of skipping ahead, so <laughs> okay. look, my brother, I'm going to have to bring you back one day. Uh, but next time, bring a designated driver so we can drink some more. There you go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> how soon? I like that. <laughs> okay. Now, um, how soon after that did you end up going to death row? Um, I ended up going to death row maybe a lifetime later because, like, after Easy Pass, we ended up signing the Tommy Boy. Okay. And we put out the Hunter Spokes record, which was on um, Time Reveal album. Um and then we put our legends and then when we left and came back to Los Angeles, um, we put out um, Rich Thug's album. And then from there, which was on my label, um, I put out a solo album and then I end up signing on as a VP at um, Death Row, okay. which was the late, it was early 2000. It's, it's right in the middle of um, Suge's incarceration. He called me up to um, run the label for him because he knew what I did with Ruthless Records and my position and everything. And he wanted me to head the label. So I went over there and done that. And then I did the Pac record until the end of time. I produced that. Um, I was music supervisor and I was ex head executive on that. And then I did a I did an archive record on Snoop. Um, 
I did a dog pound record, um, and then I did two gangsters for the radio. Dope. Yeah, there was, there was a doc. I, I guess a document, the first documentary they did after everybody after it fell apart. So, yeah, yeah. I have. And then we were doing it above the law record called Diary of a Drug Dealer. For I know probably people ask about that record, but that was a, that was the album that was going to be on Death Row called Diary of a Drug Dealer. Never came out. Oh, we wow. like three songs for it. Do you still have those three songs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still okay. have them. Yeah, I still have them. I have a lot of um, release above the law records. Okay. Yeah. You, 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 well, I have a lot of unreleased above the law records. Yeah. Well, I'm sure people that are probably listening right now are probably mm -hmm. dying like, okay, when yeah. is that shit coming out? Yeah. Well, yeah. The book was doing a book. When, me and Chaos are thinking about doing a book right now. Me, him, um, Cocaine, and um, Go Mac, we're thinking about doing a book. And uh, we're doing, thinking about doing a biopic. Uh, we don't know whether we want to do the book first, then we're going to put the music out with the book and the biopic. So we're, just, we're trying to figure it out. Okay. Yeah. I have to ask you because you you were so close with easy mm -hmm. and then you deal with suge yeah okay yeah yeah which is one and the same but go ahead yeah <laughs> this is one and the same but yeah now yeah. how was your relationship with suge and w w did he ever like sit there and say hey man tell me about easy or did he ever no i mean because everybody knew everybody i mean we're, we're from the same camps i mean you know the thing about the breakup was um it had a lot to do with, you know like Suge gets a bad rap about like how every everything broke up. Suge was a person that kind of showed us who Jerry Heller really was. You know, mm -hmm. Jerry Heller was a great guy. Rest in peace, Jerry Heller. He's a great guy because he actually we don't get position without Jerry Heller. Yeah. But what we do know is that things weren't fair to us after we became a franchise. After we became a a, um, a hit making franchise, I think people should have kind of like either showed us what the business really was or got the fuck out the way. And that became the the problem between Suge, Eric, and Dre, basically. Because okay. he was exposing that it wasn't fair. He never was exposing that it wasn't fuckery going on. He just said, it's not fair. So let's make it fair. And when it couldn't get fair, Dre just decided to roll in the sunset. And Suge was like, you know, at the forefront of it. And that's why he gets the bad. Cause that's why I always say they mirror each other because really all he just wanted to show us was that it's not fair, you know? And Eric felt like, hey, come to me with that. Don't put a middleman in a way, you know, that we all know, um, we all know each other. Yeah. You know, and he has nothing to do with the business. He's a great guy, but he has nothing to do with the business. Because at one time, they were really cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. And until he started exposing everything that was going on, that's when they started having issues, you know? So what I tended to do, my respect for Eric was, you know, high, you know? But I wasn't a fool. I was like, okay, I'm a businessman too. You know, I got to see what's up. So I always kept a good relationship with with um with Shug. You know, yeah. through the process, you know, because I felt like he had really nothing to do with it. He was just a guy that's saying like, look, the paperwork ain't right, Hutch. Hey, look, the paperwork ain't right, Dre. Hey, look, doc, the paperwork ain't right. He never was being malicious like like Eric was a piece of shit. He never said that. He was just like, it's really all stemming from what Jerry Heller was drawing up. No, you know what, what, I mean? what made him look so, into that paperwork? Just Well, I think just because he, he, he came from another place to where other artists was winning more than we were winning okay and we was powerhousing and we wasn't winning like that for us when you looked at how we was living we wasn't living like no powerhouse did it make sense we're still him? working yeah it's like we, you guys should be like living like off the you should be like <laughs> living, <laughs> living like hustlers you should be living a life you know what i mean yeah. like uh, what you guys are doing you should be living a life you shouldn't be showing up having to show up to work you know what i'm saying should be on a yacht somewhere you know yeah. as far as when you look at how the business actually works you know what i mean and he just showed us that you know and in the process you know some of us were able to renegotiate and in the process some of us weren't so you know some of us rolled in the sunset and i think that's what's dre's thing and i don't i kept a good relationship with suge because i thought that he didn't do anything wrong you know what i mean i mean he never you know i mean as far as business is concerned you know he never did anything wrong as far as him exposing now he had issues with he had issues with eric Wow. You know, but after Eric had passed, then we all had to be like, you know, hey, man, you know, we all have to be grown up now. Yeah. We can't be stuck on like, you know what I mean? Like this childish shit. 
So for me, he asked me to help him, and I took it from there. And he always was, he was official until he got home from prison. You know what I mean? Like he always was like above board. And then when he got from prison, he just started, it just started turning into the same old shit. And like, I'm friends with Dre. I'm friends with all these people, man. I don't want to be at odds with nobody no more, man. That's cool when I was 19 and 20 years old, but I'm 30 now. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm older now. Like that's not, I don't want to be like that no more. You know what I mean? Like I just really didn't 10 years into my career. I didn't want to be like that no more. So we never had conflict. But we had the utmost respect for each other. And I got the utmost respect for Suge because Suge always looked out for us. He never was like a person that didn't look out for nobody. You know, I don't like how people give Suge that rap. Okay. You know, Suge always looked out for people, even though, like, in the process, it kind of got, things got, like, a little out of pocket. But everybody, listen, everybody out there, in this business, it's business. Everybody going to try their shit. Don't get caught up. It's, it's right. that everybody gonna try their shit. It's just up to you to fall for it or not. Everybody tries their shit. They can be cool, all that. That's why I, back in the days, I never was in like rocking chains and we the this family, we this because when my lawyer come and tell me that this paperwork ain't right, it's fuck you, homie. You know what I mean? Right. I'm just a street dude like that. It's like, hey man, you trying to show me on this pack? Fuck you, homie. I'm gonna see you somewhere. Right. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> it's the same thing in business for me. You know what I mean? And I've been like that with Easy. I've been like that with Suge. That's why I say it's the same. Right. You know, when shit went right between me and him, I had to check him. Like, look, homie, it ain't cool. Yeah. Look this. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. it's it's we men. Yeah. You know, you've been in the contracts. Yeah. You gotta stand up with a man and say, look, hey, shit ain't right, man. Yeah. I know we cool. Hey, we was at the game together. Hey, we just okay, <laughs> this shit ain't cool. It's Tuesday, man. This shit ain't cool. My attorney said, you know, it ain't fair business. Right. So Okay. Yeah, so it, that's why I say it. they're they're businessmen. So yeah. don't get it twisted, man. Don't get it twisted. You know, Eric, Eric 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 was like a person like this. Eric was like, "Hey, man, look, you signed to me. You ain't right. going nowhere. Right? As cool as motherfuckers want to make him, it, he was a businessman. Yeah. Just like Shug, they were businessmen, dog. They don't don't play them games, man. Them dudes right. didn't play no games, man. You know, uh, on a scale of one to ten, mm -hmm. as far as ten being reality, you know, and zero being or one being fantasy mm -hmm. on a scale of one to ten how accurate was straight out of compton probably an eight okay right eight yeah okay and i think it was i think the things that the points that were made in were necessary to okay. make the film be a blockbuster because it's a blockbuster yeah so. I, I mean because i know they mentioned you guys's name yeah yeah, yeah. you know yeah i, I think it i, I would say 80 percent. Yeah, yeah okay the other 20 percent, we still be watching the movie See, yeah. that's the thing about the other 20%. Yeah. So, okay. Just think now, about it like that. When yeah. was the last time you saw Easy before his passing? Mm -hmm. uh, last time I saw him, uh, we had a meeting. We were meeting about um, just the label in general, what we're going to do, the moves we we're going to make. Um, and that it definitely was going to be a change in the guards, you know, and then we were going to bring back things back the way they were. NWA was getting back together. Um he wanted to um, renegotiate. I was in the middle. It's funny. Last meeting I had, I was in the middle of renegotiating the deal for above the law because my contract was up. We we're one of the only groups that honored our whole contract. You know, so yeah. he was either he was going to give me the give me the keys to the building, <laughs> or I was going to be out the door. Right. And he promised me that he would give me the keys to the building. I could do whatever I wanted to do because I earned my keep at that point you know what yeah. I'm saying? my place at the table at the at the real table you know what i mean um and then he just talked about he wants to put nwa back together and um how know, close was that of it coming back together it was close yeah. definitely close yeah it was close it the reality of it like when he got back from new york we met when he got back from new york after he talked to cube and then he said he talked to dre and they were trying to put it all back together i mean rim was Ren was still around, so I just finished. When I think me and Ren had just finished the Villain in Black album, um, Villain in Black album. So okay, yeah. So now, um, oh God, I don't want to fucking end, but okay. <laughs> so good. Let me say this: uh, there will be a part two. So there will be. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Now, what can people expect today from Hutch Code mm -hmm. One Eighty Seven? Yeah. Maybe another above the law, obviously. Rest well, you definitely peace. got, the, I mean, you never got a, another above the law because there'll never be another above the law because of KMG. Yes. You know, we held sacred. 
Um, but we do got archive records that me, um, Cocaine, and KMG are on, on it, me, him, um, and the rest of our producers, along with DJ Chaos, have produced in there and, um, you know, they're already done and everything. So we're definitely going to put out, like I said, when we do um, our book and our biopic we're working on right now. Um, and then uh, me and Cocaine just finished a record, uh, ALGF record, Architects of G-Funk. We just finished that record, um, which we, after this crazy coronavirus stuff, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with it. Because uh, <laughs> we were in the midst of figuring out what we we're going to do with it. But um, yeah, me and him finished a group album, which we're a group called Architects of G-Funk. And then I got a record that I'm doing. I'm under a new name, um, which is um, Mansa Musa. I got the Mansa Musa album coming out, Royal Blood, on my birthday, um, August 4th. Um, I'm working on the second single, um, Wake Up, right now. Um, and then I got my Mansa Musa clothing line. I have my um, internet magazine, Digital, um, 187 Rock Boy Honeys, that's coming out. And, um, and I'm working on my television show, The Black, Black Godfather. Yeah. Oh. yeah, so I'm working oh. on that series right now. So, um, and shoot, just check for me, man. I mean, you know, I, I'll come back, you know, whenever you need me, man. You know, we family, man. We we from the soil, man. We from we from the fold, man, as we say. Yes, sir. You know, so I, thank you for having me, man. Uh, you know, uh, it was a pleasure. And I love um, to get to the questions, here. man. And, you know, you always can follow me at uh, Massa Musa Royal yes. on my IG. You know what I'm saying? Y'all more than welcome to ask me whatever there. You know, whatever <laughs> above the law questions y'all got. Or y'all can follow me at 187 Rock Boy Honeys um, underscore world E and T. Um, I'm there all the time, every day. You can check out all the fly honeys and me clowning. <laughs> That's my magazine network. And, um, we have a lot. I have a lot of fun every day. <laughs> so that's my inner. That's my entertainment, interactive thing that I do every day. So you can follow me there. And any questions y'all have, you know, I'm I'm a gangster man. I, I tell you, <laughs> I ain't a rat now. Uh, so I ain't gonna tell them nobody. But if you ask me a question about me, I can answer it. <laughs> dope, dope. And I'm glad you answered all of mine. Now my last question, uh -huh. and I hope I'm at liberty to ask, mm -hmm. is that. You had mentioned you were in a Easy E documentary, or it's in the process. Yeah, yeah, it's in the process. Can you shed a little bit of light on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, the cool thing about the Easy E documentary, I don't know when it's dropping. It's a We TV. Um, 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 it's a it's a document docu series. Okay. Um, I think it's for for um, it's, it's a lot of us talking about our relationships with um, with Easy, and um, we talked about we talked about Steve, we talked about the Rhodium, like how it impacted. You know what we was doing growing up in Southern California, and everything is a great documentary. So check for that. Definitely, it's gonna. I think it's coming out this summer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Summer, coming out soon. I know. It's, I know. It's, we did it. We did it maybe two months ago. So it's, it's coming out soon. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, at this time, uh, once again, I know you pretty much said a bunch of uh, uh, what can people reach you. Is there any extra shout outs you want to give? For anyone oh no yeah 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 just want to give a shout out to um, the cocaine i want to give a shout out to you know all my family um um shoot that's about it man you know rest in peace cam g rest in peace easy e you know my ruthless family all my ruthless family out there everybody you know what i'm saying all around the world and you know much love dope you know? dope i'm gonna go ahead and give thank it my, you man uh, having me thank man. you brother yeah. thank you next time like i said uh next time i interview tell me what you want ahead of time and I'll have all the liquor for you. Bro. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm gonna have a designated driver next time. We go. We gonna turn up. But you know, I think this one, I wanted to be more politic. Uh, I mean, not, not politically correct. Correct. Exactly correct. So I didn't want to turn up too much. Because <laughs> okay. I don't never be politically correct. I'm yes. always direct, Jack. I want to give a shout out to uh, Big Hutch Co. Co. One Eighty Seven mm -hmm. Above the Law. Okay, and I also want to give a shout out to. My boy John motherfucking Elkins because without him this motherfucker wouldn't be happening. That's right. Also want to give a shout out to my boy DG DG Media Clips and I want to give a shout out to Noel for being our special guest today. Yeah, you know? she was hanging out with yeah, us. Yeah, she was hanging out with us. So yeah. other than that, once again, go to Rodia Mixtape, well, documixery.com, get twenty percent off uh, the documixery when you use the promo code TRMD twenty. You get twenty percent off that. I got the mixtapes available for download. Eventually, we're gonna have uh, the cds ready and eventually we'll have the blu-ray ready for um the documentary so other than that wednesday i'm gonna have a double feature i'm gonna have two special guests i'm gonna have an in-house producer for ruthless 
and for death row. And I'll tell Hutch who it is after, but I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to wait for tomorrow on my IG, on my Facebook to find out who it is. So other than that, God bless. Uh, stay Corona safe and That's see right. you Wednesday. Big Hutch, thank you very much. My thank brother. you, man. God so, bless you, brother. Thank you, man. <laughs> thank you, Appreciate brother. you. Thank you.